Thank you, everyone, for being here today. Um, we will start the meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, Council Member Patton, could you lead us? To the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We. Um, are now on to the consent agenda. We had one item pulled by Council Member Patton. That was C3. Yeah, um, so this was just to set a public hearing for an annexation AX0124. Um, the, it was slated through consent to be set for May 7th, but the applicant has shared that they have um, some contractual deadlines that um, really necessitate them getting action on April 16th. Um, we appreciate the dedication to balancing the agenda and the number of public hearings. If we move it to April 16th, that would take us from eight public hearings to nine. So I'm hopeful that my colleagues will be amenable to that and we can make an exception to the like traditional eight public hearings. Everyone good with that? Is that a motion? If there's no questions, yeah, then I'll make a motion to set the public hearing for April 16th. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, that was unanimous. Thank you. And now, could I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you very much. Next, we have um, planning report and recommendation of the Planning Commission. Oh, no, wait a minute. Okay. Good afternoon. Yeah, there's no, no report um, from the Planning Commission. They have not met since your last meeting. Okay. Um, are there, what is the um, build up of caseload look like? Um, um, there's, Some, it's not overwhelming though. The, they're keeping up with the work in general, I'd say. Okay. I think, I think the concern is that we're, it'll all like us, will slog us as we try to get all these cases in before summer break. Well, that's I think what that's I'm, the, I think that's where the That's what I'm trying to determine from. what yeah. the backlog looks like. I, I don't know if it's appropriate now or more um, when we do our council member reports, but I guess one question I have is, can we get an attendance 
check up on 25% of the members of this board and then the other quasi-judicial boards, I think are the Appearance Commission, Board of Adjustments, and um, the Civil Service Board because certainly folks have volunteered to participate. We want to put them on the board, but we want them to be able to complete the work in a timely manner. So I, I would ask the, Mr. Clerk, the clerk's office, to compile that information and, and provide it to the council so that if we need to make some adjustments on those boards, um, we'll be in a position to do that. If we could include that in the manager's report, I think that would be helpful. Uh, so, and just what period of time would you like that for? For 2024, maybe? Or you want to go back farther than that? Maybe, 23 as maybe well. Maybe year to date. Yeah. Year. So, 20, I guess 23 and 24. Sure. And then do, you know, come back to council or report it back in the manager's up the weekly manager's update. Manager's update. Okay. And then we can, we can do that. Yes. Take a look at that. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. All right, um, next we have special items. Um, this is rezoning Z9222. Good afternoon, I Ira Mabel, Planning and Development. Um, so this is the New Bern Stationary Planning Rezoning. Um, public hearing was closed in March and you took some action then. Mm -hmm. Um, and gave us direction for at least this meeting. <clears throat> so in, in March, close of the hearing, uh, council did vote to apply the transit overlay district um, as recommended by the Planning Commission Committee of the Whole with some exceptions. Um, you also took action on three individual sites to change the base districts. Um, so that was the 600 New Bern, which is the Explorer Elementary School, the Zach's Gas site, and Duplex Village. Um, so this is the, the map of the ordinance. So you might recall we requested a 30-day uh, effective date. That was to give us time to compile all that stuff. Um, so this is your current action, the gray color here, where the, the transit, the TOD was applied. And then there are some um, black outlined and, and numbered sites where you did the other zoning actions. So this will be effective on the 4th of April. <clears throat> Um, so for today, during that meeting, you asked for a couple more categories of sites to be brought to you. The first were affordable housing. Um, so not counting the, any of the ones in the, that you already took action on, on the fifth, um, we have identified these five sites. The, the first, the uh, credit union is the most preliminary, so they've had some talks, but nothing really concrete yet with staff. Um, the Lake Haven has submitted a site plan. They are currently under review, but not approved. Um, Duplex Village is some clarification. I'll go, I'll go over that when we get to the map. Um, Washington Terrace is a portion, a portion of that that's owned by DHIC. And then there are a couple of, of sites slated for um, small-scale affordable housing development by Southeast Raleigh Promise. <clears throat> so to, these are the overlaid on top of the, the maps you've seen before. Um, so the SECU site is there um, on... New Hope Road, um, that's the one I have the least information about. And then the Lake Haven site um, is, is fairly well along in, in at least the uh, application stage. So those are all both in the Eastern Station area. Um, in the middle, so <clears throat> the sort of colloquial, when people mostly refer to Duplex Village, um, it is the, the sort of triangular block bounded by Hawkins Street and Newburn Avenue. Um, there was email correspondence from Housing and Neighborhood that's described it that way, and I believe staff on the fifth on the podium drew that outline. Um, however, to be perfectly thorough, uh, the original Duplex Village did include these two lots on the south side of Hawkins Street. Um, so Duplex Village was purchased by a private developer who then sold part of it to Raleigh. Um, so the developer still owns this sort of larger lot on the west side, and the city owns this other smaller square a lot on the east side. Um, so we were interpreting your, your motion as, du quote, duplex village on the 5th to not include those sites, because most of the time they are not included when people talk about them in public. Um, so just wanted a little bit of clarification on what you'd like to do with that today. <clears throat> uh, this is the, the uh, Washington Terrace site, so um, most, most of Washington Terrace has been or is in the process of being developed by DHIC. I believe there are four phases 
that cover sort of the rest of that squiggle. Um, and this would be the fifth. I don't believe there are any plans that I could find public of what they intend to do. Um, the TOD is already mapped here, but the, the base district would be proposed to go to RX5. Um, and then there's, these are the two, two sites that Southeast Raleigh Promise has um, around Idlewild and State Street. Uh, you also asked for a second category of sites likely to redevelop. Um, so there are two pending rezoning requests, so privately initiated by the property owner rezoning request, um, which implies some near-term redevelopment, at least um, thoughts on their part. Um, and then two other ones that we've had some discussion with property owners over the years and over the course of this rezoning. So again, walking through the same um, station area maps that you're used to. This is a 2022 rezoning request for half of the Tower Shopping Center. Um, there is now a pretty new request for Wake Med, uh, Wake County, and Wake Tech property. Um, I believe that's filed. Yeah, it has a number, so it's been filed. Um, and I believe they've had their neighborhood meeting last month. Um, so that is in the works in the planning department. Um, this is the, um, this triangle, so New Bern Avenue, Pool Road, and Southeast Raleigh, uh, South Raleigh Boulevard. There are a handful of property owners who own the majority of that. That's the Lincoln Park Holiness Church, um, of Mr. Zell Lucas, and um, Solidarity uh, Capital Group. Um, they've been meeting for many years to, to discuss issues. Um, with this neighborhood, and I, th I believe have sort of reinvigorated their seriousness in looking at their options. Um, so they do not represent the entire ownership, but they do a pretty pretty large stake um, in that in that triangle. They call it the triangle. Uh, and then finally, um, Grayson Homes has, I believe. Um, well, we've been in discussion with them, and they may have sent you some material. Are interested in um, doing some development? They have. Uh, implied that they are looking at the transit uh, overlay district affordable housing bonus. Um, but the, the other sites are in the affordable housing bucket because they have some sort of funding that we think are attached. Um, this would be entirely private. Um, and so this, this, all these dotted outlines are actions you took on the fifth. So this is the 600 Newburn site, the pink one in the dotted line. Uh, you've also been asking for vacant sites, so I took this opportunity to sort of give you more detail um, and, and vet the list. So I do, I'm not gonna go through these, but if there are any particular sites on the list, I believe I, there are 40 that I identified as truly vacant sites. Um, I'd be happy to, to go over any of those. Um, Could you go over the two larger sites? Uh, sure, on this particular map, so there are two that are industrially zoned, um, six and seven, um, and I did group them by common ownership. So there are a couple of lots in V6, for example, that are the same owner. Um, there's quite a lot of industrial zoning on the, the south side of Newburn here, and what's where it's labeled Wilders Grove. Um, these sites are mostly, mostly residential, uh, proposed for residential mixed use, or RX. Uh, there are two near Wake Med. Um, this V21, I think, is, and these are both vacant. See how well I can remember all of these. Um, 23 is owned by the, the golf course. Um, a lot of these ones that are not labeled you know, are actually, I believe, part of auto repair, so they're like parking lots. Um, so I did, I did do a little bit of judgment on what was truly a vacant site or not. Um, and this whole stretch, I believe, that's the golf course is also vacant. I mean, well, they're all vacant, but um, wooded. And then the, uh, you know, as you move western, the the sites do get smaller, you know, matching the, the block pattern. So they're just sort of scattered, undeveloped parcels. Um, and then I did not overlap. So like the um, the Lincoln Park Triangle does include vacant sites, but since that was on the list already in your memo, uh, we did not... Um, double dip, so to speak. 
Uh, since we've made it to the end, I might as well go to the last. So finally, we have scheduled a, during your work session on the 9th, a mobile tour of the, uh, of the corridor. Um, and I think next we are planning on the 7th of May. Um, so we should, if you do have some further questions or requests from us on the 9th, we should be able to accommodate that on the 7th. Um, and if Councilmember Patton, I believe, s submitted a sort of loose draft calendar. So if that were to be followed, then we would be looking at the, the eastern and, and part of the middle station uh, base districts on that time, unless there's uh, other direction you'd care to give us today. So that is the end. Happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Council Member, Mayor Pro Tem Melton. Um, I, I don't have questions. I have some thoughts, though, and I don't know if if, if folks want to go first. Um, well, I have. I definitely Council have some Council Member thoughts, Branch, if I may. Um, first of all, thank you for this information. I think the areas where we identified as far as affordable housing um, and looking at the partners and things that are doing that are working there, I think if we can act on that, that's a good next step. Um, I will mention that I did talk to the owners of Grace, Grayson. They are looking to use private dollars to do affordable housing, um, and they will hope to, that they can be included um, in some type of, of progress today um, so that they can work in collaboration with the other development right across the street. So um, there's really one cut at one time in that area as far as impact, but they have pledge and they've done other works in the community as far as um, private equity, as far as affordable housing. So that's, those are the main things I wanted to highlight. When it comes to Duplex Village, that piece, you are right, the other side of that street, only someone that around here would consider that still part of Duplex Village. Mm -hmm. um, my thing is, I, w I think the whole thing should be included as we have that conversation. So those are the main things I would like to highlight. And as far as going forward, I think after having the tour and looking at it, I think it'll help you know, all council members as we progress. And also I think in working with individuals in the community, um, having those highlighted conversations will be very keen as well. Do you have a desire to move forward today on the affordable housing site? Yes. Um, anybody else have questions? Okay, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, well, Council Member Patton, do you? Yeah, just uh, so just to clarify on your earlier slide, the Week Three campus, mm -hmm. you're suggesting that we actually take no action because they're hoping for the campus master plan rezoning. Is that right? Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Got it. I think that's my only question. I think to share where my comfort level is, um, I'm happy to take action today on the designated affordable housing items, and then the three remaining sites that are likely to redevelop. Um, I also spoke with the applicant for the New Bern and Swain site. Um, and while it's you know not guaranteed that they will use the density bonus, it does seem likely that, and it seem, I trust that they have an earnest interest in it. Um, I would not have a comfort level today on taking action on all of the vacant sites that are listed here. I appreciate them being assembled in this way, but didn't quite have I would prefer we take these take these vacant sites in the geographic buckets that we could, we could you go up. to that slide mm -hmm. there was another One thing I do want to point out where you have the blue city owned, that's the property that we um, purchased and we're leasing to a developer that's currently, they've started clearing it to build affordable housing. So that work is already in progress where you see that big swat of blue development, mm -hmm. blue color. Yeah, that's Newburn Crossing that's often appears in your briefings with, so they, they have a site approval under the existing zoning. Um, so not really a sense of urgency for them. For decision making. Okay. Council Member Harrison. Yeah, I just want to say I'm fine to move forward with the first group of affordable housing sites. Um, the second grouping, it looks like we have three now um, with the fourth removed. I will say I've talked to one of the three, but I don't have, I haven't had any conversations with the other two. So it would be my preference um, before 
voting for this that I would have that time. Um, I do want to note that we received the agenda at the same time the public does. Um, and this was a holiday weekend, so I didn't have any time to talk to folks that were um, put into this group. If, if I can, especially for Lincoln Park, they've been meeting before I was ever elected on council. Um, as far as gaining ownership, working together. These are all minority owners um, that have a vested interest as well as their church in that area. And I think, you know, their work is to keep affordable housing. They're already using vouchers and everything of that nature. So I feel very comfortable with the work that they've been doing for almost the last 20 years um, there um, as far as, the, you know, moving that part forward. Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah, so what I was going to say, and I'm glad to hear from my colleagues, um, was I agree with all that. Um, I'd like to do the affordable housing sites. And then on the page that says sites likely to redevelop, I would be comfortable moving forward with the three of them. Um, but if there's not consensus on that, I at least would like to do the Grayson Home site. I have met with them. I think they've met with most of council. Um, they've got a good plan for this site to provide affordable housing. And they're also um, simultaneously doing another affordable housing development through our frequent transit um, development option. And so they're walking the walk and talking the talk. And we've had a lot of discussion about will the density bonus get utilized or not. And I think these two sites going first with plans ready um, would be a good indication of, of whether the density bonus would be successful or not. And so I would like to, to um, to proceed that way, and if we don't have consensus on the um, the other two, the Lincoln Park, and then the, the the first one that has its own zoning case, we could hold those until the tour. But I'd like to do the Grayson Home site and then the other affordable housing sites. I would like to get Lincoln Park done. Okay, um, I, I'm I've been talking to them for it feels like years because it has been years, and um, <coughs> I think that would send the right message. So understanding you may or may not want to vote on these today, and um, the public hearing has been closed, I do believe representatives from both of these groups are in attendance. If you had questions either for today or for to bring for us for next time, um, that would be your discretion. But I think I see both in the audience, if that were of interest. Can we go ahead and do the ones that we have all consensus on, and then if we need to hear from folks, we can hear from folks? Can we have a motion, please? Move for. So go ahead. I'll say move for approval of the affordable housing sites as well as Greystone um, with the um, zoning. Oh, hold on, because they're going to get me if I don't read this um, consistency statement. I move to adopt the consistency proposed statement dated April 2nd, 2024, contained in the agenda materials, and to approve the zoning amendment with the adoption and effective dates described in the agenda describe in the agenda items under recommended action for those parcels that I mentioned. Second. The four parcels. The four parcels and Greystone. The affordable housing and Grace, Grayson. Grayson. What about the other two? We're gonna, We're gonna have that conversation and hopefully I, I can come back and make that motion today. Okay. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? I'm not, I'm not opposed, I just wanna make sure we've made a clear motion because we said four parcels, but then there's five listed in this section. so. I just want to make sure we're given a clear motion. The affordable housing parcels, state, state Employees Trading Union, Lake Haven, Duplex Village, Washington Terrace, and, and the Southeast Raleigh Promise, plus Grace Sun. So that'd be total six. Did you vote? Aye. Looks like it was unanimous. Okay. From our end of the table. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. And I also thank wanted you. to clarify on the Grace and one, so that would. Um, all the requested action, including removing the NCOD on that parcel so the TOD is mapped. If not, I'll make that Yes, I would. Yeah. So, I move. Yes, I would say just to be clear though, on the Southeast Raleigh Promise site, that is, those are two sites also within the NCOD. So, I'll, so without I'll just indicate that for these affordable housing sites, the I'll add that the motion would be to remove the NCOD, they're vacant, no one's living there, and add the, um, the, the TOD to those sites. Second it and make it clean. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. That was unanimous as well. Thank you. That so, leaves the rest of that so, site's likely to, revelop, to redevelop slide. Right. So I do know, like we said, we have representatives from Lincoln Park here. 
I would love if we can get that done today, get it done today, if they can adjust, address any questions council members have. Sorry. Who is here? It's, so if you, the site to tell you where it is, if you drive down Newburn Avenue, right where Pool Road breaks off to the right, where there's a 24 hour tobacco shop, um, you have the Carolinian, you have Lincoln Park Church, you have um, Jack Seafood, and then you have a bunch of individual houses all the way up until you get to Raleigh Boulevard. So it makes that triangle. Yep, who is here from, if you'd like to come up please. Who has, if you could give your name, please. Uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Steve Monty. I'm with Solidarity Capital. Um, first off, apologies. Reverend Ratcliffe was going to join us today, and he got called away to a funeral. Uh, we have uh, Carlton Sutton is here. He's the owner of Jack Seafood. Um, I believe one of Mr. Zell, either Lucas Sr. or Jr., uh, is either outside or on his way or trying to make his way in. So, and my business partner at Solidarity, Jim Falanga, is here as well. So that's our cohort for today. Thank you. What questions do you have? I, I'm sorry, but I don't know anything about the project. So if you, you wouldn't mind just giving us an introduction. Um, and I might have additional questions later, but this is the first time that I'm learning about it. So thank you for any anything that you can provide. Sure. Well, the project is... Uh, really decades in the making. I mean, it's a collaborative group of stakeholders and property owners, uh, but the lead actor has always been uh, the Lincoln Park Holiness Church. So they're the anchor institution in that triangle. Um, and a little background there, I mean, uh, Reverend Ratcliffe's uh, grandfather, the uh, Bishop Eli Ratcliffe Sr. was the one who founded uh, that church. The current building is the fourth or fifth physical instantiation of a church on that site. Um, Reverend Ratcliffe's father, Bishop Eli Ratcliffe Jr., uh, is really uh, the late Bishop Eli Ratcliffe Jr., uh, is who really had a vision for the church to be proactive in acquiring land, and that has happened uh, under two generations of kind of sacrificial offering, if you will, uh, uh, among the church membership, uh, and put them in the position to to uh, to own the land that surrounds the church. Uh, and then um, both uh, the late Bishop Eli Ratcliffe Jr., but also the current pastor, Bishop uh, uh, Reverend Ratcliffe, Reverend William Eli Ratcliffe, um, have been convening a group of business owners, property owners, and other neighborhood stakeholders, um, at least since... 2010 or so, so almost 15 years. Uh, I'll give you some sense of the accomplishments of the group. In 2012, the first project the group undertook was to relocate the Debenham Clinic from its downtown Raleigh site uh, into that neighborhood, both to serve people in that community, but also because their, their former site was, was too small and adequate and, and frankly slated for development, and they were going to need to uh, leave that site. Um, and our company, Solidarity Capital, participated in that. It was a project of Passage Home, and um, they purchased the site from the church, uh, went to the bank for the senior financing, came to us for the subordinate financing, and that happened in, in 2012. Um, shortly following the Carolinian, which had offices across the street from the former Debenham Clinic site downtown, uh, also came to relocate and, and lease from one of the buildings that the church uh, owns. Uh, after that, we brought in uh, the Black Farmers Hub, which is Demetrius Hunter's business. Uh, his father also ran a produce distribution business many decades in Raleigh. These are all uh, prominent black-owned businesses uh, in, in Raleigh. Um, other stakeholders through the years have been um, uh, Bill LeCount of LeCount's Catering. Uh, he's recently retired, asked us to purchase his site. We did that to hold it for the group until the group has its plans further mature. Um, there's a uh, uh, hair salon business that's on that corridor. Uh, Zell Lucas obviously has been a major, Lucas Transportation has been a major business in Raleigh for, for decades that he's been one of the uh, uh, people that gets the contract from uh, 
Wake County Public Schools. He has about 100 vehicles and delivers special needs kids uh, with his vehicles and drivers. And as a prominent property owner and has a long personal history that dates back decades when he grew up in the neighborhood. And of course, I probably should let uh, Carlton speak for himself, but Carlton is the owner of Jack Seafood. And if you could also tell us what is your proposal, um, I do appreciate the history, but I, I'm trying to understand what is the goal here. So the, the group has had, uh, you know, the longstanding goal and the vision of Reverend Rackless father was that uh, it would be a neighborhood that celebrates black business and entrepreneurship, uh, and that the church would continue in its uh, role as the anchor institution in that community. Mostly, I would articulate it. Um, that the group's goal has been that development would happen uh, by and with and for uh, the people that have been longstanding stakeholders and residents in the community, that it kind of wouldn't happen from the outside in, but from the inside out. They wanted to have that agency, uh, and that's why they uh, were as proactive as they were in assembling land. By the way, I want to point out, uh, Zell Lucas Jr. is uh, in the room at this point, um, and um, you know, I honestly feel like, I mean, uh, Councilman Branch has been attending the church's breakfast. We've been meeting monthly on a Wednesday morning since at least 2012. And he's been a frequent guest with us. I mean, I feel like he could probably do more justice to this narrative than, than I could. But from a, a development perspective, to answer your question, um, we've had the property owners together uh, as recently as uh, two summers ago to go through a, a series of community design charrettes with an architect firm facilitating that process. Um, we've been collaborating on assembling blocks that would allow for larger and major redevelopment projects to go forward. Uh, but I would, I, you know, I will tell you honestly, uh, there is more work to be done. So what we know, we're clear on our, on the community's goals, and um, uh, but, but there needs to be a refreshed master plan uh, to really allow the development planning process to go forward. Council Member Fort. Council Member Branch, I know you've been uh, raised in the conversation, so I just want to chime in on a couple things. So Mr. Sutton, thank you for being here. Um, Mr. Lucas in the audience, thank you for being here as well. Um, I've had a number of conversations with Bishop Radcliffe as well, um, and I think the most recent about this particular piece of property was when he was attending one of the BRT um, meetings that the Raleigh Chamber sponsored at Martin Street, uh, I think it was last month, maybe the month before. And, you know, what he communicated to me is that he definitely feels like, you know, I think he said something along the lines, if you're, uh, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu type deal, um, which is basically the church wants to be involved with what's happening in that corridor. Um, he's particularly interested in housing and the viability of maintaining small businesses along the corridor. So what he shared with me was the vision would be maybe something like a, a mixed use um, type of development where you've got housing, some affordable housing, maybe some market rate, who knows, but also the opportunity to keep some black owned businesses along that corridor. So I, I know he's not here today to, to communicate what his vision is, but that, that was the sense that I got in the conversation that we had. I uh, hadn't talked to him in the last you know two or three weeks, but that was what he, what he shared with me. And, I know you've been attending yes. the meetings, and so you could. Yeah, and that's the continued conversation they have is making sure the businesses that are there remain there. Um, they were heavily involved in working with our staff and transportation with the bus rapid transit, and they even work with the alignment of the um, of the lanes that are being put in to ensure there was no negative impact to their businesses, so that it can remain open and remain on a viable asset to the community. So that's the, the thing. I think it's one of those things, if we're asking, the question is, do you have these big plans to change everything all at once? They No, but their plans is to make sure that the businesses there can stay there and make incremental development changes and improvements along the way without any negative impact to the community. And also the consistency of zoning and the knowledge that this is what they could do. You, you can't really hold an architectural um, kind of assessment or, you know, bring in the community to have those conversations if you don't know what's anticipated. And I think it provides some level of certainty. 
Yeah, just be curious to hear from the owner of Jack's. Um, I've been by, um, I've enjoyed the catfish, and I'm just curious um, if you want to talk about your vision um, since you're here with us. Um, I think primarily, uh, as it's been stated, that we want to just more or less maintain the continuity of that area uh, to that community to continue to meet the needs of that community opposed to a lot of other ideas coming in and making some changes. We would just like to have a, a say-so as far as the stakeholders within the community as to the direction that we would like to maintain uh, with the stakeholders that are there. And um, just make sure that the, the community in that area is not changed, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. And this might be a question for staff, I'm not sure. How many parcels, again, are connected here, and what would be the zoning change? And if there's yep, anyone so else there, also in the group mm -hmm. who would like to speak, that would be wonderful, too. Yeah. Sure. Um, so there, there are 70 um, in the triangle, just before I give the Mr. Lucas a chance. Um, they are currently zoned neighborhood mixed use 3 and residential, so um, NX3 and RX3. Um, the proposal at this point, given the work that came out of Planning Commission, would be to increase that to 4. Mm -hmm. The Transit Overlay District was mapped already last month. Um, so four with a bonus of affordable housing bonus could be potentially up to six. Okay, and that's um, again you said seventy distinct yep. parcels. Yep, seventy parcels are uh, under fourteen acres. How many owners? Just curious. Did not count that. Okay, that's um, all right. <laughs> Hello, uh, James Montague. I don't know what happened to Zell Senior. He's supposed to have been here, but I think he's lost. Uh, but Zell Jr. is here. Zell, you can come up. So you asked questions about what the intention is for the development. One thing we've been working on for the last couple of years is doing some affordable housing, uh, four-story, five-story with commercial on the bottom floor, uh, apartments, affordable uh, aspects on the top floors. Um, of course, the whole thing couldn't be affordable because it is a fantastic location. Construction costs are up. But if we could maintain some affordability on the residential side as well as you know, create places where black owned businesses and minority businesses would not be pushed out. That's what we're trying to do. Thank you. Okay. And this is Zell, Zell Jr. here. Go ahead. Yep. Yep. That's it. That's pretty much my dad's vision. <laughs> <laughs> same as everybody else. I mean, we want to keep it the same. Just want to get it cleaned up around here. So that's it. Thank you. Were there any other questions from council members? So, so my question is, this would go from NXRX3 to NXRX4. Um, we've already placed the TOD on this. There is no NC, NCOD. Um, it's 70 um, parcels. Um, if there aren't any questions, I would make a, the appropriate motion. Can you make the motion? All right. So the motion is I move to adopt the proposed consistency statement dated April 2nd, 20, April 2nd, 2024, containing the agenda materials to and to approve the zoning amendment with the adoption and the of dates described in the agenda items under recommended action for the Lincoln Park corridor. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, that was Council Member Jones and Black. If I might interrupt with a comment from the city attorney. <laughs> um, so in the previous two motions, I believe Mr. Branch made a motion and referenced the consistency statement, and then there was a second one clarifying that for Southeast Raleigh Promise, the NCOD would be removed and the TOD would be mapped. Mm -hmm. He would like you to have said that that also had a consistency statement. Um, so, so it's the so same. It, it, I make all, it, all you need to do is just adopt the consistency statement. You've already adopted the zoning change but we need a corresponding consistency statement to go with the removal of the NCOD since the removal was not a part of the memo that you guys are going through and approving. It's the same consistency statement? Same. Okay. So I move to adopt the proposed consistency statement dated April 2nd, 2024, contained in agenda materials, and to approve the zoning amendment with the adoption effective dates described in the agenda items under arrangement action and removing, those in, removing the NCOD. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. I'm not in favor. <laughs> Are you? 
Councilmember Jones. Was this the is same this one? I'm confused as to what this just was. This was the same one we just made? No, th this was, this was um, the first set, the affordable housing sites and the Grayson Homes. Um, okay. They're empty. They had the NCD on it. We had to take that off to put the TOD on, but we didn't read the consistency statement, oh. so we had to go back. Okay. No, I'm, a, I'm in favor. Okay. Just final parting words. So this is what you will see on the 7th, unless you all want to tell me something different. I, I wonder if, in out of deference to y'all not preparing stuff that we're not ready to take action on, maybe we just do the eastern station area and hold middle one for a future date. Why don't we do this? Why don't we do the tour and then provide some feedback? That is also, there is time on the 9th mm -hmm. for you, you to. Because you might, we might see some areas in the middle okay. Great. that we, Thank you. there is some consensus on. So let's do the tour and then provide feedback. And then, Mayor, since we're talking about the 9th, um, you should have already been notified, but I need an absence, uh, excused absence. I have a trial. Um, yes. So I will not be here for the work session or the public comment session. Yep. Thank you. I received that notice. Thank you. Okay. Next um, is rezoning Z4623, the North Boylan Assemblage. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of Council, uh, Matthew Burns with Planning and Development. Uh, this is a request to rezone about half an acre, uh, go up from three stories to 12 stories, maintaining the office mix use zoning. Um, and some proposed conditions prohibit some uses that are normally allowed in OX, and they also want to remove the NCOD. This item last appeared at the March 19th City Council uh, agenda on report of Planning Commission. And at that meeting, Council deferred setting a public hearing date to allow time for um, to speak with the applicant about the case. And Planning Commission uh, voted to send this request to you with no recommendation um, unanimously. And we are recommending a public hearing date of May 7th or May 21st for this particular case. Councilmember Harrison. Yeah, I've had time to talk with the applicant. Um, I think ultimately we'd like to do a public hearing on May 7th, but we're going to wait to set it um, so that they have time to add conditions. So this should come back to us, I think, at our mid-April meeting, April 16th, in order to set it. Um, they're gonna make a couple of conditions to reduce height and add affordable housing contribution. Understood. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, next we have um, TC722, um, co-living. This is an update and options. All right, good afternoon, uh, council members. My name is Keegan McDonald. I'm with Planning and Development. I will be presenting on this text change, TC722, uh, co-living, providing an update to you all on what we've been working on over the past few years, and then also some potential options to move forward with this item. A Little bit of a refresher, because it's been a while probably since we discussed this in a, in a public setting. So this is an external text change request that was filed by Ben Stevens back in 2022. The central premise was to create a new group living use titled co-living, and that would be permissible within the R6, R10, and mixed use districts. After some discussion, the council ultimately did authorize the text change under that initial framework in June of 2022. And through that time, um, we had numerous discussions both with the applicant and then also with the city's city attorney's office to understand how we could sort of effectively regulate this use to mitigate some of the identified impacts. And we ran into numerous challenges with that initial framework. So that's what I'm here today is to kind of describe that to you. And then again, some options to move forward. In January, through the city manager's report, we provided you all with a memorandum that summarized basically the same material and laid out those options. So just looking to get some guidance from you all today. An overview of what co-living is, it really just describes kind of the living situation amongst 
um, a collection of folks, typically not a family, um, people who otherwise would be considered roommates that might share either living, cooking, and or sanitation facilities. With co-living, usually the sleeping quarters are separate, but then one or more of those facilities listed are shared amongst the residents. And co-living is a newer term. Think of it more like an umbrella that can encompass a couple different options, some of which you may be more familiar with, like lodging house, boarding house, or single room occupancy. Why co-living has gained some popularity in recent years is a variety of factors. Of course, this is subjective to the specific person who's interested, but given the kind of shared spaces, there can be increased social interaction amongst the occupants, access to different and unique living arrangements, being able to, sh to share those spaces, sometimes being able to locate in a neighborhood um, that you might, un might not otherwise have access to, and Depending on, again, the location and the units themselves, they can sometimes offer more affordable rents than even studios or one bedrooms. Just again, given the fact that you're able to share some of those facilities and split the costs amongst the, the residents. What I wanna describe um, is how this co-living use would operate within the UDO. So I'm just gonna do a little bit of a walkthrough about how we regulate uh, two primary types of residential uses. Those are First, household living, and then on the next slides, group living. So household living is really the typical type of residential use that you see throughout the city, and it has two really distinct parts. The first is that it's residential occupancy of a dwelling unit, and a dwelling unit has to have three components. Those are sanitation, cooking, and then sleeping facilities. So it has to have those components in order to be considered a dwelling. And then it's residential occupancy by a household. So a household is defined in our UDO. That definition is provided in italics. So it's one or more persons occupying a dwelling unit, provided that unless all members are related by blood, marriage, or adoption, no household shall contain more than four unrelated persons. And that part highlighted in green is really the key element here that sort of controls for how many unrelated people can obviously occupy a dwelling unit. And that is kind of what's um, in question with the co-living use. Household living, there's a number of different um, types that we have. Single unit living, two unit living, multi-unit living are the most common. Those are detached house, duplex, and apartment. So that's what we see most frequently. The others listed are things that we kind of have unique to Raleigh in our code. Group living is defined really as a residential occupancy of a structure that does not meet the definition of household living. So principally, more than four unrelated people. So the uses listed there, boarding house, congregate care, dormitory, et cetera, allow more than that, uh, those four unrelated people to occupy a structure and then also share some of those facilities that would otherwise have to be isolated to individual dwelling units. This slide I just wanted to show more for reference to see how these types of uh, group living uses or non-household uh, living uses are regulated in the code today in terms of where they're permitted. So in residential districts, highly restricted. Most of them require a special use permit, which is a process through the Board of Adjustment. Mixed use districts, somewhat more permissive there. Um, However, even boarding houses have, are qualified as a limited use, meaning there's some standards you have to adhere to, which I'll get into later. Um, supportive housing as well is widely permitted, but that's a use that we have to accommodate under state law. Um, and so there's use standards associated with it, but that's why you see that permission in residential districts. And I'll again have a slide later to provide a little bit more detail there. The applicant's original proposal would have had the largest impact in residential districts. And that's because where we see detached homes and tiny houses built there today, they're really meant to accommodate um, single unit living, which again goes back to this definition of household. No more than four unrelated people, which has an effect of kind of controlling for residential density um, in these districts. Um, R6 and R10 do permit, you know, the townhouse building type in R6 and apartments as well in R10, so that there is some increased density there, but nonetheless, that, that definition for household still um, holds and that none of those individual dwelling units can have more than four unrelated people. The proposal would have allowed up to 12 people to reside within a detached house or tiny house within the R6 or R10 districts, and again, that would have permitted um, 
any of these where you could feasibly build one or convert a unit, um, even along you know the same block, for instance, to kind of turn over into these in these co-living uses, which obviously creates much larger increase in density within those R6 and R10 districts. Relatedly, the applicant also had some interest in mixed-use districts. Um, as we'll get into in a few slides, mixed-use districts don't have strict limitations on density. That's really just controlled by building height and setbacks, effectively. Um, we don't have a strict cap in mixed-use districts. Um, so less of an impact there, but I just wanted to note that was part of the original proposal. As we worked through this with the applicant and then also the attorney's office, we, of course, identified a number of challenges. The main one, which I've uh, identified already, is these higher residential densities um, in that it would permit more than four unrelated people, or would permit more than four unrelated people to occupy a single structure. Applicant's proposal also didn't require any spacing between co-living uses, which would again allow you know, multiple within the same neighborhood or same street or same block. There's also regulatory limitations under state law. So we are unable to regulate building design elements for one and two family structures, so things that might make the structure more aesthetically pleasing, for example. We are limited in how we can regulate that under state law. And relatedly, we are also uh, unable to regulate minimum floor area or room sizes for structures that are subject to the, the standard residential code. And so that was something the applicant had proposed to kind of ensure an adequate amount of space. Really just have to rely on the building code um, to enforce that on the front end. And the building code imposes pretty minimal ratios in terms of how much square footage per occupant or, or per size of room. Um, lower than even the applicant was willing to do through the zoning code, but we're just limited there. And then the last is overlap with other uses. So the ADA and state law require cities to accommodate family care homes. We regulate those as supportive housing, and essentially those are uh, a housing option for persons with disabilities to accommodate their needs, to allow them to live um, together in a, in a group setting. So we have a special carve out that does allow for more than four unrelated people, but they have to have a disability in order to qualify. And even with supportive housing, we have strict standards about spacing, requiring on-site management, um, requiring a, a limited, uh, is a limited use, excuse me. And the co-living use that this, the applicant has presented or wanting to pursue would be pretty indistinguishable from that once you get to the permitting stage. We'd really lose the ability to regulate supportive housing as we do today um, if the, the co-living proposal was to move forward. And so um, this is the uh, kind of just showing how that would play out if someone wanted to propose a use with more than foreign related people in, an, in a residential district. Again, we'd have a challenge in distinguishing between supportive housing and co-living at the permitting uh, or at the outset of permitting. And so they would essentially bypass some of the restrictions that we have in place today for supportive housing. All that being said, we wanted to provide you all with a few options that we think could potentially mitigate some of these impacts. And so there's three of them that I'll, I'll move through and then do have a next step slide for you all as well. So the first option would involve just permitting co-living within mixed use districts, except the office park mixed use district because we don't permit residential uses there today. And the main reason we think this could be an option is because again, mixed use districts don't have the issues with density. Um, we don't have strict density caps, rather. So we already allow micro units if someone wanted to build that in an apartment in a mixed-use district. Um, mixed-use districts, of course, also accommodate more intensive development, which someone might deem co-living to be. So we think that effectively mitigates a lot of the issues um, that were identified earlier, particularly with uh, residential districts. So how that would work would be to add co-living to the list of group living uses, including a spe special definition, and then also potentially considering um, modifying the definition of boarding house. That's the kind of most analogous use we have today in the code, but it's quite limited in how it can be um, pursued. So we would likely need to amend that definition just to create kind of a clear distinction for co-living. And with that, I do want to just provide a little bit of background on boarding house, just so you can understand how, how there is that overlap. So this is the definition, obviously very similar to the description provided for co-living. 
But with boarding houses today, there's a number of use standards that would make developing it within a mixed use district really challenging. First being <clears throat> that the facility is, was constructed as a detached house. Of course, if you want to do large scale cool living, that would be uh, a challenge. Limiting the total occupancy to six people. The, the goal here in, in mixed use districts would be more than six. Um, and then also a spacing standard. So no boat boarding houses can be within 1,200 feet of each other. And so what we were proposing is if you are to either modify or distinguish between co-living and boarding house, that uh, use standards one, two, and four be considered for elimination or revision within the mixed use districts, just given the fact that they would pose a practical constraint to doing it. And again, more of a reference slide just to see how boarding house stacks up today. And this also a reference slide, just wanted to show you all where the mixed use districts are that um, this co-living use could be done under option one. Option two is again a short-term option, much more discreet than changing the use table. What this would involve is simply amending the definition of household to allow more than four unrelated people to occupy a household. So this is something that was, has been pursued by other jurisdictions. It would have universal implications, it would mean any home you know, throughout the city could then accommodate more than four unrelated people, whatever number you choose to set that at. And this would really enable that smaller scale co-living that um, the applicant has expressed a desire for. The larger scale co-living that might be accommodated in a mixed use district can be challenging to obviously finance. It's sort of an unproven model still, um, requires you know, higher level of investment upfront this would enable smaller scale projects, perhaps someone um, who's just starting out as a developer or has interest in providing housing to, to do a project like this. Option three is, falls into kind of the long-term bucket. It would be to, instead of taking any immediate action via a text change um, or in, a, in addition to taking immediate action on a text change, addressing co-living opportunities through the comprehensive plan. So, as you all are aware, we're pursuing a comprehensive plan update. If you were to instruct us, we could specifically engage with the community on this topic. I know it's come up in other contexts, trying to understand what the interest level is, um, what the concerns may be, where it might be most appropriate, inserting specific policies into the comprehensive plan to facilitate future text changes that might enable it. So we wanted to present that as a, as a third option. So potential actions with all that in mind, um, as it relates to the text change, you could either authorize staff to pursue option one and or two. Um, they could really be pursued in tandem because again, one really affects mixed use districts, the other household definition, um, and they both kind of address this co-living idea from different angles. Um, one, the more intensive, larger scale option, the other, the smaller scale. Of course, the item could be held and or referred to committee for further discussion. Alternatively, if you don't want to take any action on the text change, you could just choose to withdraw the text change authorization. And then four is you could request us to address co-living through the comprehensive plan update. And again, that could also be taken in tandem with the text change actions because it's more of a long-term uh, evaluation. So I had been in communication with the applicant. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure if he's in attendance, but if he is, um, okay. Perfect, so there he is. <laughs> Just wanna let you know that he's available if you have specific comments or questions, and of course I'm happy to respond to questions as well. Okay, um, Council Member Black, then Branch, then Pat. Hi, so the first question I have is specifically about option three. You mentioned some challenges. Would you guys be able to address those challenges specifically related to like the regulatory limits and the issues with the supportive housing slash family care homes within the comprehensive plan when looking at co-living? I don't know that we could overcome those challenges specifically. Um, I think it might allow us for to rather identify specific areas of the city through particular policies that might be suitable for co-living. Um, some of those challenges exist in state law and so absent a change to state law, we're really pretty limited. Um, I think it's more an opportunity to engage, understand if co-living is sort of a delicate subject matter for existing neighborhoods, maybe there's specific neighborhoods or areas of the city 
where it would be, you know, feasible or, or likely to be accommodated. Personally, I appreciate the forethought into some of the conversations from the community that really need to guide this understanding. Me personally, I'm pro co-living and I want to see it as many places as we can get it across the city. Um, you know, we're dealing with a population of people where 48% of the city is renters. And then they just dropped this new study that said like the cost of living here is like over $100,000 and people are still only making like the, an average of about 75000 So the cost of living is increasing way past the wages. And I think co-living is an opportunity to get different people into housing types that are present across the city and really uh, contribute to some of the affordable issues that we're having with like housing and placement because I don't think we're going to housing filter our way through like the affordable housing crisis we're having so I really like the idea of co-living but I understand that there are some concerns that may be represented in like neighborhoods but personally I'm really supportive of option one Possibly option two, I'd love to hear some of the conversation across the table and then seeing what can happen with option three for what the city can bring for addressing some of the like concerns from the community that we, we would see. That's pretty much it for me. I just wanted to understand some of those challenges and where they can be like alleviated because specifically the ones around um, minimum floor areas is kind of concerning because I would worry that they would make it too small. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, and just on that point, um, yeah, there's a specific kind of limitation on setting any type of minimum floor area for, for residences. And I think the original intention there is that cities don't price out people by only requiring residences of a certain size, but it has that effect of, in this, in this context, kind of forcing us to rely on building code, which is fairly minimal. Okay. Next, we have Council Member Branch, then Patton, then Mayor Pro Tem. So definitely, thank you for the presentation. My question is, if we go with option, if we add option two, I like option one, but if we add option two, how would that impact the special permit that's needed for group living? Yeah, so this wouldn't have any specific effect on the supportive housing piece, um, in that it would just make a universal change. In fact, it might make it easier for people to do supportive housing. They just wouldn't call it that. They would just be roommates, you know, in a house. <laughs> so um, supportive housing today allows actually up to 12 people. But again, you have to um, qualify as someone with a disability. And then there's limitations on spacing and um, requiring on-site management. So um, all that being said, it really wouldn't have any direct negative consequence. If someone wanted to do larger scale supportive housing, they would still go through that same process, but it might open up smaller side or smaller scale opportunities, excuse me, um, in, in so, other places. So from a residential standpoint, if someone has R10 and someone wants to place a group home in their community and we change this number, you're saying there would be no impact? Rather, if they were to stay at whatever number you select, let's say it's six, just for uh -huh. sake of argument, they could do that without any type of permit. It would essentially be just be recognized as any other type of household because households allow up to six unrelated people. Okay, and I'm bringing that up because I've had pushback and concerns within the community when someone has tried to have a transitional place to help people coming out and help them get back into society and live. And, you know, they go through the, our whole process and then there's a big pushback um, that we're receiving. So that's why I wanna understand how, what impact this may have on that. Council Member Patton. Yeah, um, I have some comments too, but first a question. Can you go to that chart with the, all the letters? Yeah, the, yes, that one. Oh, I think they're the same. Then. Um, can you just give me like a super quick reminder of limited use versus special use, and then whatever the and P just means permitted. They can just yeah, do that. Yeah, yeah. Right. And I, I did want to note. I think one error on a later slide. I had mentioned supportive housing requiring an SUP in residential districts. It's actually a limited use, um, as the table shows. Um, essentially, what that means is you have to meet a set of requirements, and then you're permitted to to establish that use. There's no special approval. It's just whereas a permitted use means there's really nothing associated with the use characteristics, limited use poses, uh, imposes some operational restrictions. So with supportive housing, the big ones are, there's obviously an occupancy limit. 
there's a requirement for on-site management. There's a spacing standard, meaning you can't locate within close proximity to another supportive housing residence. Um, and I believe those are the main ones. So that's, that's what limited use means. And then special use means there might be operational restrictions or use standards, but in addition, you also have to go to the Board of Adjustment and receive an SUP. And so that requires um, going through a quasi-judicial process, putting on evidence to show how you meet the burden of proof um, to receive the special use permit. There's also noticing opportunity for participants to engage in that process. So it's more, inten more time intensive. There's a cost associated with it, um, a little bit more, or definitely more unpredictable than a limited use. Got it. So limited use is administrative and special use is as a quasi-judicial yes. process. Yes. Okay. That's helpful. Um, thank you. Okay, so I, um, I, I am supportive of find, finding a path forward. I support option one and option three. Um, we hear from our homelessness service providers and our affordable housing providers that things like co-living and, and SROs are an important piece of, of the, the carpet of, of housing options that folks need as they, they move on to the next chapter of their life. Um, and then I know that zoning code is not the primary prevent prevention of uh, office to residential conversions, but this is like one tiny, tiny little barrier we could maybe remove while we wait for the North Carolina Building Code to to catch up and, and allow for more office to residential conversion. Um, we have heard from some, some close watchers of the council agenda that there is some skittishness about option two and what that might mean for, you know, how, how many folks can live in close proximity and the sort of knock on impacts of like trash service and parking and, and all the rest. So we have like a cursory sense that that might be a little more, there might be a little more concern in the community. And so for that reason, I, I would not want to delay making the progress we can make. And so I'd, be, I'd support option one and option three. May I pro Tim? Yeah, I was gonna add that I also think to move this forward, I would support option one, and then also option three. Um, option one, looking at the map, seems like a good place to start because the mixed use districts are um, in places where I think this type of co-living makes most sense, access to transit and, and other areas. And um, I think it'd also be a good way to sort of get this um, type of housing out there while we look at other, other areas where we could expand and we could engage the community a bit more on that. So I think option one is a great first step and then also option three um, for long-term planning purposes. So I, I'm ready to support those two at the appropriate time. I am as well. Councilmember Harrison. Yeah, just so I understand the process. So whatever we approve to move forward today, it would be going through the text change process. So it would go to planning commission um, and all these options still need to be a little bit more spelled out, correct? <laughs> That's right, yeah, we don't have exact ordinance language yet, but if you were to authorize, let's say, option one for us to kind of move forward with the mixed district piece, we would begin the drafting process like we do with other text changes, go on the portal, and then proceed to planning commission and or text change committee for that kind of initial, more detailed review. And what community engagement would be available for folks interested in the topic? So the standard process is really through either the portal or those meetings, the text change committee or planning commission meetings. Mm -hmm. If the council wishes, you know, you could direct us to do some more engagement, whether that be ask a planner sessions, which we've done for other text changes. Um, occasionally, we've also created like separate web pages or specialized web pages where it kind of describes a little bit more in depth what the text change goals are, kind of lays out a timeline, that type of thing. So that's that's been our practice for a few items where I think we either got direction or felt like additional engagement was needed. So that's on the table. Yeah, I think I would like to see some additional engagement if we move forward um, with any of the options. I can support option one, but I do have a number of concerns about option two and their effects on neighborhoods. Um, I think when you combine you know, this opportunity, which definitely can help the housing affordability, but then combine it with missing middle, um, there's a lot of different um, development that's all of a sudden possible um, that does have sometimes negative you know impacts when it comes to traffic parking um, and just yeah neighborhood character so um, I could move forward with option one with additional engagement as I do think a lot of folks might have some 
just input that they want to provide. And I think it's important too that they understand the benefits of this. And we've had conversations about this topic in uh, district D meetings and it, and it does really help to have, you know, people who are there saying, hey, I need this. I'm gonna, you know, have a lower rent if I have this opportunity. And then other folks are like, well, I'm concerned about parking, but where can we meet in the middle? Um, so the more conversations that we can have, the better. Councilmember Black. So with option three, is there going to be opportunity for community engagement? I just want to like. We haven't, of course, kind of crafted the exact plan, but I think our goal is to make this topic a concerted effort, yeah, of the community engagement that occurs with the comprehensive plan update. So if there's additional feedback there, um, of course, we're welcome to receive it, but we haven't really discussed it beyond, beyond that point. Cool. Um, something that um, Councilmember Harrison didn't mention was like utilizing our CACs as a place for doing spaces. Like Ask a Planner is great, but I think you know the CAC meetings are would be really engaged around something like this, um, as well as our possibly like working with the community engagement part department, maybe our board that we have on some of the outreach stuff. Um, but are there any more questions? Because I'm ready to make a motion. I, I just um, have a couple of comments. Um, I've read some really interesting articles on co-living. And it's not just young people living together. Co-generational living is becoming a thing now. And one of the stories I especially loved was um, we had some younger women living there with children. And then they, we had some seniors living there. And they would babysit the younger kids. Everybody w came out a winner. I mean, it was like the, the moms felt that they had a safe place for their children. The seniors felt useful and wanted. And it, it was a co-living place outside of Boston. I thought, wow, that, that, says a that tells a story. But it also makes housing more attainable. Um, and I, I think that this is long overdue. So um, I think Council Member Black wants to make a motion, so <laughs> go for it. Well, the first thing I wanted to understand, I think there's a little bit of con like concern around option two. So one of the things we can do is maybe move it to committee for further discussion. So I didn't know what the appetite at the table was for that, um, moving option two to... It could. Mayor Pro Tem, you had your hand. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I think if we proceed with option one um, with the text change mm -hmm. and then also signal that we want to use the option three, which is the, um, the um, I'm gonna say it wrong, the comp plan, um, I think that would encompass option two. So like would? Okay. option one is moving a text change forward now in the mixed use districts. And then I think if we do the rest of it through the comp plan, okay. that wouldn't give us ton of opportunity to engage the community on other areas. So more time. Okay, so um, then I would like to motion to authorize staff to begin work on option one and option three for, uh, represented in the agenda. Do we have a second? Council Member Patton has seconded. All in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, that was unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we have the um, report and recommendation of the city manager. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Two items today under the manager's report, the first of which is the much-awaited and long-awaited Councilmember Patton tax rate structure change. So we have RPD representation from the Raleigh Police Department here to walk us through this item and give you some options. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, Council, Madam City Manager. Thank you for your time. We appreciate you having us here. And so my team and I are prepared today to talk to you, as the manager stated, about a proposal for a topic that's well overdue, and that's our taxi cab fares. There's a tremendous amount of work that has been done in this area, and I certainly want to publicly thank Assistant City Manager Michael Moore, as well as City Transportation, with partnering and working with us on this. So today I have members of my team here, Deputy Chief, Rico Boyce is gonna to talk to you a little bit about the historical, where we were, where we are, where we're going with this, and also to Sergeant um, Joe Wilkins, 
who has done the heavy lift on this, and he's going to actually give you the proposal that we have for you. And then we'll conclude with any questions that you might have of us. All right, so at this time, Deputy Chief, if you'll come forward. Thank you, Chief. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Mayor, Council, Madam City Manager, uh, Deputy Chief Rico Boris, RPD. I want to provide a little background about the work that went into uh, crafting a taxi rate increase proposal. Uh, in early 2023, members of our taxi inspector office, uh, they began to benchmark with other cities within the state to see where the city of Raleigh's tax proposal was in comparison to, those, to their city. Uh, we looked at Charlotte, Greensboro, Winston, Fayetteville, basically the larger cities in the state of North Carolina to see where we align with the tax rate uh, fares. Uh, we also expanded and looked at cities throughout the country to see what their taxi rate was and once again to see how we measured up with, with their taxi rate. So we looked at Atlanta, Washington DC, Dallas, Tampa, and uh, Detroit. Uh, once we gathered all that feedback, then we looked at the numbers and we uh, saw where we were aligned with the other cities. Uh, we began to craft a, a taxi rate proposal. Uh, I will say that you know RPD understood at that moment that this was just bigger than RPD and we needed to collaborate with our partners in city transportation, which I echo what the chief said. I really appreciate city transportation helping us out in this endeavor. So once we started meeting with uh, transportation, uh, we realized that another important piece to this whole taxi rate increase was actually the taxi owners and drivers themselves. So we decided that we were gonna have two listening sessions. So on January 9th of this year, we had a listening session up at Marsh Creek uh, Community Center. And then on January 11th, we had another listening session at our Southwest District Police Station. I will say the owners and drivers that uh, attended that, those meetings, uh, they provided very, very thoughtful uh, feedback about what they would like to see in a taxi rate increase. Uh, and I do want to take a moment, I believe there are some here in the audience that are here. Um, basically, their input is what crafted this, because uh, they've been asking for this for quite a while. So it was, uh, I just want to take this moment to say thank you guys for showing up and thank you for your support. You. Yeah. So after the two listening sessions, we were able then to put some numbers together to see how we can uh, align the city of Raleigh's taxi rate with those cities that I mentioned. And Sergeant Wilkins is about to come up and, and show those numbers and figures, but I, I will say we all know that the taxi community has been a very vital uh, community partner. Uh, we understood that, or understand, excuse me, that they provide a much needed service, especially in the Go Raleigh Access and the paratransit program. And we knew that any taxi rate increase could potentially have an effect on that program. So that's why it was important not only for RPD to, to work with city transportation, but also to make sure that the taxi owners, that they came to the table as well, and we all collaborated to put together what you're about to see here. So thank you for your time, and let's say Sergeant Wilkins is gonna come in, he's a SMB in putting all these numbers together, so thank you. Mayor, Council, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, I wanna go through some numbers that we've had, and I've worked with the taxi uh, companies for almost a decade. Uh, and uh, they've come out, like the deputy chief said, expressed their feelings, where they're at, and you know how inflation and all that has affected them. So we reached out, done the best work we could do to forward them the best opportunity going forward. Um, so what we looked at is the drop rate, which is the initial start for the meter, the mileage, so each tenth of a mile, uh, what the meter goes up, and then the wait time uh, throughout Basically, the last few years, we've benchmarked multiple cities. 2003, we went back and looked at the most uh, current rates uh, amongst cities. Really specifically, most recently in North Carolina, the cities that were most comparable to our size and, and the things they offer, such as venues, hotels, uh, reasons people would go and commute and uh, travel with taxis. Uh, we met with the uh, local businesses. Uh, I think we've got uh, four companies here represented today sitting out here and we'll go over the recommendations so right now it's a dollar 95 is as soon as you sit in a taxi the initial fee the drop rate it's a dollar 95 we're looking at moving that to three dollars so it would go from a dollar 95 to three dollars just a round number uh, we also put uber and lyft on the right side to kind of see a comparison of what uh, you know 
app-based programs are using and what their rates are and how they differentiate from a taxi cab. Um, minimum fare, $1.95 is 25 cents per tenth of a mile, so $2.50 a mile. We're looking at moving it up to 30 cents every tenth of a mile, so it would be $3 a mile. And then moving the wait time from 25 cents to 30 cents a minute wait. So if you run into the store, they can wait. They've turned the wait time on. It just counts up while they go. The uh, fare can come back out, get back in the car, and don't have to call another taxi and start back over to $1.95 or $3 proposed. So our proposed rate would be going to $3 for the start fee and then $3 per mile, uh, 30 cents every tenth. If we look at Uber, uh, they have start rates. Uh, the base rate is $1.57. Then there's a booking fee. Basically, they're not going to move without a minimum fee of $6.90. So it's not going to be much more than our current rate won't be much more than it is now, but it won't overprice them so high where they're, uh, where people would just not use taxi cabs. That was one of the things that we worked as a group with us and uh, with the taxi companies is to not price them out of business, but to keep them in a fair rate because they haven't had an increase in uh, 17 years. Uh, by the end of this year, it'll be 18 years that they haven't seen a fair change. Um, uh, we were looking at removing the handbags and stuff like this. It was just uh, confusing. I don't think they even used it. It was just something in the ordinance that cluttered up the ordinance. So move, moving that that out. Um, right now, they are currently not allowed to have a cleanup fee. So if someone throws up in the back of the taxi cab, they weren't allowed to charge anything. Uh, Uber's charge up to $150. Uh, we thought it would be fair to... Uh, give them the opportunity to have that, and we uh, propose a $75 option for a cleanup fee to pass that on. Um, here you can see what the prices are compared to now, what it would be, and then a comparison of uh, digital dispatch such as Uber and Lyft. So under the current, you know, dollar ninety-five and two fifty per mile is the left, the proposed, and then you can see. Uber on a great day when there's nobody needing a, a call, there's just the lowest rates possible, is fairly uh, low. But in the, in the prime time, uh, such as venues when they're letting out for concerts, sporting events, uh, shows, uh, normally when they hit their prime rates, the taxi company would actually be lower than the, the prime rate. So we're still giving them the increase. They're making uh, more profitable business, and especially with the inflation that we have now but they're not pricing themselves out where they would not be selected uh, by these other, other options. Um, so that's kind of what we come up with between the police department benchmarking other cities and collaborating with the taxi industry itself. Uh, these are the closest cities, which would be Charlotte and Greensboro, that are very similar to us and the way they have the venues, uh, size, population. Um, going to $3 would be uh, right in line with Charlotte. $3 for the drop fee and then $3 per mile. Greensboro is $3.80 for the start fee and then it's $2.80 a mile. So on a five mile trip is about the same thing, very comparable. Um, so our recommendation is to restructure the rates to the new three and three. Um, that way they are allowed to compete in the market. Uh, they, they deserve a raise. They'll create a schedule where uh, it can be reviewed more than every uh, two decades. Um, so we can come to the table and, and check this out more often, benchmark it, work with our community, work with the uh, businesses and, and get that so we don't end up like we are today. We don't want to see that happen again. And then we're looking at, I know this is quick, but May 1st, 2024, which will be our effective date for the new rate. Uh, we have a main reason for that effective date in May we do our annual inspections. So the second weekend of May, we do annual inspections. We inspect every taxi cab in the city. There's 360 plus taxi cabs coming through this inspection in May. That means we check the meters, we put new seals on the meters, and they're up to date and comply with state law for the next year. They have to come through and we have to check the meters in May. If we change this and this goes in effective after our inspections, they're going to have to come back through again and we will have to check every single meter to make sure that it is calibrated and correct. 
So it would, you know, twice the work for RPD. It would be twice the work for all the taxi drivers. It would put them, you know, temporarily out of you know, service for a few hours or even days, depending on how large the company is. And so we're hoping that if we can get this pushed through quickly, we can have this effective, and then they will only have to adjust their meters one time, and then we will be uh, able to speed this process up and uh, just be more efficient. All right, um, that concludes our presentation. We're open for any questions. Council Member Fort. You kind of touched on my question about the May 1st date. So appreciate your explanation about why it's so quick. What would be the strategy to notify the public that these rates are going to change since it's going to be such a quick turnaround time for the effective date? Uh, that would be reaching out uh, through social media, through our um, uh, our connections, media, and um, <coughs> yeah, we'll yeah. Push it out on our website. Yeah, there, just through all. <laughs> no, you said it right. We will push it out through our social media. We'll also through our city communications to make sure that the public is um, informed. And that's usually our process. Anytime we see any changes, anything that we're doing new. I would think too that we'd want to engage the taxi owners so they can start that notification process too on the ground. Yes, and, and we had like two meetings, like we said earlier, where they all come in, and this is what they were requesting. I think the, with the companies we have here, we have almost 75% of the taxis themselves uh, covered, um, so they're prepared and, and ready to push out. And they do have repeat customers and, and their customers that they would be able to reach out to uh, very quickly. Yes, ma'am. Council Member Jones. Thank you so much. Um, in the backup material, I know it said that RPD first wanted to start at $6, and then you were talking to the taxi companies and said they didn't want to get priced out. What was the reason that you guys wanted to start at $6? Uh, that was a little bit of a, a different. We were going to lower the mileage and increase the start rate. And at the time when we were looking at the, the trips that they were making, it would benefit them more because the shorter trips, they would be able to make more money on the longer trips, they would balance out or even make a little bit less. But now based on the, the current uh, trend, the, tr the trips that they are taking, uh, it looks like three and three would be the, 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 the most beneficial. I believe the 650, that was something we looked at five years ago and some other cities had gone to that and then some of those cities have switched back to a, a, a basic thing. It, it really depends on the, the trip, the distance, and when we looked at and we were able to pull up data, uh, some of our taxi companies use digital tracking, and we were able to see all the places and locations they were going. And since now some of the venues are further out and people were traveling further out, it uh, balanced out to be about the same. Awesome. Thank you. And then you said that we have some of the taxi drivers here today? Uh, yeah, the owners are, are here if you want to stand up. Uh, Thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, I'd love to, if, if any of you would like to speak, just hear your thoughts on this rate change. How many taxi um, owners are here? Could you just raise your hand? Okay. Um, if you will Hello. take a minute to yes, do that, sir. Yes, um, I've been driving a taxi in Raleigh since 1996. And, uh, um, you know, since then, you know, we only had one raise about 18 years ago. And uh, back then, now, insurance for those taxis, because it's a commercial vehicle, so we used to pay about $120, $130 a month. Now, average is about $600, $650. So it went six folds, you know. Oil changes back then, we used to pay about $9 at Walmart, you know, $9.99, they would have a special... Now, the average oil change is about $70, 65 80 you know. And uh, tires, we used to be $100 for all four tires 20 years ago or 18 years ago. Now it's about 500 So everything went about five folds except the taxi fare. Nothing went up, you know. Um, everything just went up, you know, even cars. You know, if you want to buy a car, back then you could get a good 10-year-old car for about $5,000. Now you won't get it for 20000 you know. So everything went multiplied many times except for the cab fare, you know. Now, we couldn't even afford I'm going to explain it to you if you have the time. Now, in one hour, let's say, you get a call, somebody from downtown going to Headingham or going to North Raleigh or, you know, um, you know, if by the time you get to him, wherever you are, and you pick him up and take him, you know, that cab fare might be about five miles or four miles or three miles. 
And, you know, the meter starts at 195 and then 250 each mile. So by the time you get there, you're making about 7 to $10, you know, on that cab ride. So you spend 20 minutes going to the trip, 20 minutes, sorry, 20 minutes to drop him off, then 20 minutes to go back, you know. That's hours. So you're making way below minimum wage. And you're going to take out of that your insurance, your wear and tear on the car, your time, taxes on your time, you know, on, on your income tax, you know. Basically, you're making about three dollars for that whole hour, you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, that's why a lot of us cab drivers work 20 hours a night. You always look at it, big brown circles under our eyes. We sleep in those cabs, you know. We live in those cars, you know. And the only way to make money is on value, you know. You keep taking those five dollar trips, ten dollar trips, seven dollar trips for 15 hours, 20 hours, so you could go home and make enough money to pay your bills and feed your kids, and you know. But it's, it's, it, we get a lot of overhead. You know, those cars break down a lot, you know. Brake jobs, you used to do it for about 100 bucks. Now it's anywhere from five to $600 for brake jobs. Great. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. I appreciate it. Just do it. Yeah, appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Do we um, have any additional questions? Yeah. Um, Member Patton. Th yeah, thank you all for bringing this. This is really helpful. Um, I've like since that manager's update was circulated, I think like most of us don't even realize that the rates were regulated for like a private company would be regulated by RPD. I think that was news to me and, and certainly probably not widely known by the public. So really appreciate this. Um, and I was glad that you addressed creating a schedule to update this so we don't go another 18 years without people getting a raise. That's like not acceptable. Um, do you have an idea for how often you'll be re-looking at this? Do you have an idea of that, what that schedule will be? Um, we started doing this with our tow trucks and some of their stuff is uh, every year. We just kind of have a team meeting. We bring everybody together and see, is this something that we want to move forward or is it too soon? Um, you, know, you don't want to ask for something every year because then it just gets redundant and people just think you're just always asking. But you know, as, as we see different things happen within within the country, the state, you know, the economy, that'd be something that we're able to bring back. We have meetings every year. We have our annual meeting anyway with our taxi cab drivers and our taxi cab owners. We have both meetings with drivers and the owners. So that's something that we would be uh, collaborating with them on an annual basis and then something that we would be allowed to hopefully come back and bring to the council so that we can uh, discuss any changes. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. And then just from transportation staff, maybe even just like a thumbs up medium impact. This is going into effect before the new fiscal year. And I'm just thinking about impact on the cost of paratransit on our current working budget. Got a thumbs up. Okay. Well, in that case, if there's no further questions, I've been, I've been watching this, this um, item for several months and I'm really excited that it's finally here and I'm excited for y'all to get your much overdue raise, so I'm ready to make a motion to approve this if there's no further questions. We have to adopt the ordinance. Oh, there is language. Is, is there, I don't see special language. So, yeah, okay. We do have the um, adopted language. Um, judge, you wanna come forward? It's a matter of protocol. Do we need to go ahead and read that before? Okay. Right. She's pulling up now. Good afternoon, and thank you for uh, your attention to this matter. I'm Paul Gessner. I'm with the city attorney's office and uh, one of the police attorneys. Um, we would like to bring this back very quickly. We wanted, Our primary purpose was to make sure that you were okay with this, particularly with the very rapid uh, implementation date of May 1. 
but also the cleanup fee um, proposal and um, make those additions or, or, or corrections to the draft and get it to you um, as quick as possible. But our primary purpose is to try to make sure that we got everything to you today. Okay. I guess I'm, so if you need to bring it back to us for a vote on April 16th, April 16th is the only opportunity we have to vote on it, then then our friends only have two weeks to notify their riders, right? Well, they can notify now as long as no one plans on, as long as we don't plan on not voting for it. I mean, I don't plan to change my <laughs> vote, but I just think yeah, some so. people don't want to action. I mean, people might not want to notify their riders until why don't the vote is taken. Why don't right? we do this? Um, who would be in favor of moving this forward? Could you raise your hand, please? All right, that was unanimous, so we won't have any issue. So we'll bring it back and put it on the consent agenda. That would be good. Thank you. 16. For the 16th. On the 16th. The 16th. Mm -hmm. So I do think it is fair to address the concern about engagement and communication to start that communication? Or is it in a state, um, Chief, that we can bring it back and you all adopt it this evening? I mean, if it's already drafted, could you? I think we're ready for that. Are you ready for that? That way you, you're taking an action about something that you've already taken an action about. You feel really good about it. That's why you're the city manager. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Try to get Madam manager, out of yes, we will have that ready for this okay. um, evening if you're. All right, yeah. perfect. Okay. Great. If we could start the meeting with that, that would be perfect. Thank you. Wonderful. We'll get started right now. Okay. Um, and the next item under my report is the Go Raleigh Station security contract with Capitol Special Police. We have David Walker from Transportation here to present this item. Good afternoon, David Walker with the Transportation Department. And as you are uh, maybe aware, um, we did an RFP for security services at Girl Raleigh Station. Uh, what we'll talk about today is um, our current situation down at Girl Raleigh Station with a short-term contract. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what the scope was in that RFP. We'll talk about the proposals that we received in that selection process, and then we'll talk about a recommended action requested. So today, uh, back in December, uh, we uh, brought on Capitol Special Police and Capitol Special Patrol to provide a short-term service uh, for four months. We ended up extending that one additional month, so the current contract with them expires at the end of this month, April 28th. Uh, what we have seen is that they provide well, very well-trained staff. Uh, they utilize de-escalation tactics as they... Uh, communicate and talk with our, our clients and uh, users of Go Raleigh Station. Um, our Go Raleigh operators and staff, maintenance staff and supervisory staff are all very much uh, in, in happy with the changes that they have seen down at Go Raleigh Station during this short-term contract. And we have continued to collaborate with the DRA and their security services, our Wilmington Street vendors, and of course, Raleigh Police, uh, as well as RATP Dev, who is the uh, provider for the Go Raleigh services. The scope of this RFP was to provide two security staff from 4 a.m. until midnight. And just so you're aware, that does cover the full span of service that Go Raleigh provides at Go Raleigh Station. So if there is a bus in the station, there should be two security personnel there to uh, provide support. Um, it will also you know, provide patrol and guard functions uh, to provide a safe, comfortable uh, environment uh, throughout all of the, the Go Raleigh Station at all of the platforms, and that does include you know, two external boarding platforms down on Blunt Street and then up on Wilmington Street. Um, they will be there to enforce facility rules uh, and, again, to provide that comfortable environment for all users of the station. Um, just for awareness, this RFP did provide for optional proposal pricing for Moore Square Park. Uh, the Parks Rec Cultural Resources uh, currently have a contract for security in, within the park, and that expires at the end of June of this year. So they are uh, reviewing the proposal and will come to you at a later date if they ch decide to exercise that option. 
So our proposal was published on February 1. On February 29th, we received three proposals. Uh, we had a review team of five staff from transportation, parks, recreation, cultural resources, the Raleigh Police Department, and RATP Dev personnel. Um, from that review, uh, the bid tab scores, uh, we saw Capital Special Police, Capital Special Patrol rise to the top with the highest scoring uh, bid tab and also receiving the final recommendation from the review team. And so we're here today asking for uh, action to authorize the city manager to execute a three-year contract with two one-year options uh, in an amount not to exceed $3.3 .3 million. Uh, that total does include all five years, just so we can get that dollar on the, on the record. Um, but the total annual average contract for the first three years that you would be awarding today if, if you take that action is just under $590,000. And with that, I'm glad to take any questions. Any questions? Councilmember Jones. For this contract that we had, um, you said you extended it for a month uh, at, from our initial contract. How much did that cost us, or was that included in the 300000 The The one-month extension, the, I think the added cost was about fifty, and that kept that still kept the uh, the total contract under three hundred thousand. When we saw it first, and we heard about it first, so that was what was a a lot allotted, but that didn't mean that how, that's how much you spent on it. Is that what you're saying? Because when we first heard about it, it was three hundred thousand. So what I'm understanding is that that's how much you allowed to spend on it, and then you didn't spend 300000 so you had the availability to give the extra month's $50,000 contract. I, I think the, th the $300,000 number that was talked about is the limit for uh, the city manager to execute a contract. If it's above 300000 it has to come to city council for approval. That contract was going to be under 300000 I can't remember the exact total for the, uh, the, the initial uh, three months, but I think it was in the 230 240 range. Got it. And then okay. when we, we added that additional uh, funding for the final 30 days, it, it still remained under 300000 And then you have um, reviews from, from departments and everything. What about the public? Have you had any public feedback on how they felt about the increase in, in police presence or, or, I'm sorry, not police, but... We, we have received multiple emails, um, you know, over the last two to three months complimenting the, the services and the, the change in the environment that we've seen down there. Our, the Go Raleigh Drivers Union has spoken out and they, they actually got real concerned when they heard about this going out for bid again because they, they really uh, are in favor of the Capitol Special Police team. And so they're really excited to hear that they're, they're being uh, requested for our award. And have we gotten a report on how many um, interactions this group has had with the public? Like, were there any arrests? Were there um, disturbances? Like, how, how has it gone other than these departments saying it's been great? What have been the tangible metrics that we've received? Uh, we can get that and bring that back. I, I, uh, obviously, there have been engagements on a regular basis. Um, they have not made any arrests because they're not company police. Uh, but they engage and collaborate with the Raleigh police officers that are uh, stationed there. And anytime something happens, they're on, immediately on the radio communicating with the Raleigh police to get them engaged and involved. And then as soon as our Raleigh police is on scene, they will turn it over to them for resolution. Yeah, I'd be interested in seeing that just so that I can see what those engagements look like and um, the, the, the need for you know moving forward. So I appreciate that. Sure. Councilmember Branch, then Pat. Um, just a question on top of that, um, since we have our chief and deputy chief here, are you all aware of interactions at the Go Raleigh station? And have you seen any, what changes over the last four months that have occurred? Good afternoon again, Deputy Chief Rico Boyce. Uh, Councilman Branch, we have seen uh, the interactions between state, I mean, Capitol Special Police and the community down there. Uh, it's been a quicker response to issues that uh, arise 
uh, they're able to quickly, uh, like say, de-escalate that. RPD, we do have a presence down there, and we quickly check in with them. Um, and it's, overall, it's been a great, like say, uh, collaboration between the two departments. So we have seen it firsthand, and like say, it's been mostly positive. Uh, the two departments uh, down there. Okay. Thank you. And Council Member Patton. Yeah. Um, I guess starting with a comment, I have a little bit of heartburn over the length of the term of the contract. Um, when this was first presented in this uh, Safe Fiber and Healthy, I know you all can action it administratively, but when we first learned of it and then took it to a Safe Fiber and Healthy Committee, um, I think all this discussion was around like shifting the momentum downtown and then also utilizing other strategies other than just like security and police, right? And getting eyes on the street, adding residential units, like cleaning up, adding the street lights. Like this was one in a slew of strategies and that this was also meant to um, fill a gap while we work on like recruitment and retention of our own officers. And so I sort of got comfortable with it as a stopgap and a three-year contract certainly shifts the line of thinking from stopgap to a more permanent element of how we manage our transit system. And so um, I, don't, I don't know if I made a very clear question, but I wonder if you can speak to the length of term of the contract. Well, I'll, I'll point out that Capitol Special Police isn't here to replace Raleigh Police. Uh, they still have a presence. As a matter of fact, I think they have actually increased the number of officers uh, that are stationed in, in the Go Raleigh Station District. Uh, so they are there to, as the uh, uh, deputy chiefs stated, you know, they're there to be like a first responder in case the, the Raleigh police that are stationed within the, that district aren't immediately on site. Capital Special Police will be immediately on site for 20 hours a day. So they're there to just provide additional support, force multi be a force multiplier for Raleigh police. And uh, I don't know, does that answer your, your question? Can, can I jump in and ask a different question that may help? Do you have a, pro a provision to terminate the contract if there's some issues that arise and the council wants to dissolve the contract? Or maybe this is a question for the attorney's office. There's always some provision that if we need to terminate the contract, 30 days notice, whatever yeah, the provisions. Just about every city contract that I've ever been involved in does have that termination clause. This one definitely will have it. Um, the, even the short-term contract had that, mm -hmm. that clause in there. So if, so if something were to happen and you decided you wanted to you know, make, it, make a change, that's certainly an option for us. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that, it, that's helpful. Thank you, Councilmember um, Council Fort. I wonder if, did you consider doing like just a one-year contract? Was that an option on the table? Well, the, the, the pricing that, that is provided is based on a three-year contract, so that allows them to spread out their corporate overhead, their equipment costs, which are not cheap, uh, at, for a much longer term. So if we shortened it to a, a, a shorter term, then we may need to re-look re at the, the pricing structure, or they would need to do that. Okay, thank you. Okay, any additional questions? Hey, do we have a motion? Um, I'm trying to see what I have to do. I authorize the city manager to execute a contract with Capitol Special Police and Capitol Special Patrol in the amount referenced in the agenda. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That's um, Council Members Joan Black and um, Patton. Opposed? Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Anything else? That concludes my report today, and go pack. Wait a minute. I got my Carolina socks on. I'm, I'm Carolina, but go pack. <laughs> you are the city manager That's of right. Raleigh, so go we pack. can't forget that. <laughs> got a great degree from a couple of degrees from Chapel Hill there. Of Raleigh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for saying that, because our city is on fire right now. All right, next we have the report and recommendation of the Raleigh Historic Development Commission. Good afternoon, Tanya Tully with Planning and Development, and I am here to introduce uh, Katie Pate, Chair of the Raleigh Historic Development Commission. 
Hey, good afternoon, Mayor Baldwin and members of council. It's nice to see you all again. Um, my name is Katie Pate, and I'm here to talk to you about the Prince Hall Overlay Historic District and the work of our ad hoc committee. This committee was formed in May of 2023 in response to a memo from the State Historic Preservation Office. The committee has met six times between May of 2023 and as recent as March 20th, 2024. During that time, the committee heard from 31 individuals at the meeting and uh, staff was circulating a survey of property owners in the Prince Hall Historic Overlay District. At those meetings, issues that were heard and discussed included the piecemeal removal of parcels from the Historic Overlay District, the history and memories of the neighborhood, creation of the Historic Overlay District, physical changes to the area uh, before and since the creation of the HOD, the certificate of appropriateness process and possible preservation options for the future of the district. On January 31st of this year at the committee meeting, uh, possible preservation options were first shared. The committee decided to give property owners one last opportunity to complete the survey based on community feedback and request to extend the deadline for that survey. And on March 20th, the committee met. Uh, additional information was provided on possible preservation options. It was well attended by the community, um, but it was also a very emotionally charged meeting. Um, options that were heard and discussed during the January and March meetings uh, include, first of all, making no change to the HOD as it currently exists. Or second, uh, boundary reduction, which would include removing select vacant parcels, which would require additional analysis to determine what a new boundary would look like. Third, uh, change from a general HOD to a street side HOD. Currently, the only street side HOD in Raleigh is the Glenwood Brooklyn Historic Overlay District. Fourth would be to rework the special character essay, which is what the Certificate of Appropriateness Committee uses as the um, design guidelines to determine whether or not an uh, exterior change is appropriate to, um, to the structure. And then fifth would be some combination of those options. The committee has concluded its work, uh, but that subcommittee does not have a recommendation for the following reasons. Um, shifting committee makeup, we had uh, some changes to the membership of the commission and that committee since it was formed. And then a new committee member was considering that topic for her first time at that March 20th meeting. And then also, again, that March 20th meeting was very emotionally charged environment and just wasn't conducive to committee discussion. So it was not possible for them to render a recommendation. So the ad hoc committee will make its report to the full RHGC during our upcoming April 16th meeting. And the full RHGC will then discuss and provide a recommendation to city council. Um, so thank you. And we do look forward to bringing a full commission recommendation back to you all. Okay. Any questions? Council member Jones and then Pat. Thank you so much for all of your guys' work on it. Um, uh, I appreciate the, the understanding that there's been some changes and that that's delayed. Totally, totally understand that. Uh, we do have a case this evening uh, that's in this, the Z72, the, you know, the, of course you know, it's the, it's the hotel. And so I, I, I was hoping to get that here so that we would have it prior to, but I completely understand what you're saying and I, I do appreciate you guys taking the time necessary to fully have this conversation. Um, I don't know what that's going to mean for tonight, but I know that without hearing you guys' points of view, I would have a hard time moving anything forward this evening. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Okay. Councilmember Patton. Yeah. Hi. Thanks for this report. Um, do you, a couple, I have a couple things. Um, can you, when you talk about this March 20th meeting being quite emotionally charged, it was, can you give a little more insight? Was it from... Like, were the residents ag agitated? Was it, were the committee members the ones? Like, can you just maybe provide a little bit more insight on that? Yeah, absolutely. I was not present at that meeting, but the report that I received back was that, <coughs> um, that our, our staff and our commissioners did an outstanding job trying to keep the peace at that meeting, but just between audience members who are on different sides of the issue, um, you know, I mean, really, residents of the community kind of versus people in the development community. Um, I think there were just, it turned into some 
unkind words, you know, raised voices, just not a, not an environment that would have been conducive to the discussion that needed to be had. So that sounds like it took up most of the, most of the energy at the meeting. Okay, <coughs> okay. awesome. Um, and I, you know, make, you made the note that the subcommittee does not have a recommendation to make and that they'll go to the full RHDC. Um, this is not for you to know, but we have some other commissions who advise us and sometimes have um, pass, passed us hot button topics with no recommendation, and which is uh, not always super useful. So if I could just gently urge your, your urge the full RHDC to, to make some, some recommendation, it would be really useful to us and we, um, we really value y'all's feedback and input, so. Absolutely, thank you. And we are, we are very focused on um, taking these options that were discussed by the committee. I feel like that is the crux of the work that the committee has done is kind of coming up with this slate of options, even though they weren't able to you know, give us a specific recommendation from their group, but having that slate of options to look at and then for us to be able to discuss will definitely be the, the largest and longest item on our agenda this month. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you um, taking this up. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay, now we have matters scheduled for public hearing. Um, we will start with um, rezoning Z3623, South Saunders Street. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of Council. Um, Matthew Burns with Planning and Development. This is a request to rezone just over two acres from industrial mixed use three stories to commercial mixed use 20 stories conditional use. Uh, the request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and future land use map. It is inconsistent with the urban form map and Planning Commission recommends approval of the request seven to two. Here is an aerial showing the location of the site. It is near the Fuller Heights neighborhood um, and south and east of Dorothea Dix Park. And nearby uses are predominantly industrial, moderate scale residential, and commercial. It's kind of a mix, mix of different uses around there. Here are some views of the site, which is the current home of the Toxic Customs Motorcycle Shop. Uh, conditions, signed conditions received on February 29th, 2024 uh, prohibit many uses that are normally permitted, limited, or special uses in the commercial mixed-use district. And they limit cumulative uh, morning and evening trips to 196 and 213, respectively. Next, uh, buildings on site would be limited to 15 stories or a maximum height of 165 feet. And then the next several slides are related to a development that qualifies as a tier three site plan. So the first of those is it would require a hybrid frontage with limited surface parking if developed as a, as a tier three site plan. It would establish build two requirements of zero, between zero and 20 feet for both South Saunders Street and Prospect Avenue. Along South Saunders Street, at least 50% of the lot width would have a building facade within that range, and on Prospect Avenue, at least 25% of that lot width would have a building facade within that range. The hybrid frontage condition would also require pedestrian access and building entrances along South Saunders Street and Prospect Avenue, and would establish an exception along Prospect Avenue for a tree conservation area, meaning that the required tree conservation area, if it is required, would take precedence over uh, the pedestrian access. So part two of the tier three site plan condition would uh, require <clears throat> the dedication of 1% uh, of units as affordable for households er earning 80% area median income um, for a period of 10 years or a contribution in lieu of dedicating those units at a rate of $40,000 per unit. 
Next, a tier three site plan would require development to use at least one type of green stormwater infrastructure um, labeled with educational signage. So these measures could include a bioretention area, perme permeable pavers, rainwater harvesting, a green roof, or a planter box. And finally, a tier three site plan would require the property owner to install a bike share station within the right of way on a location agreed upon um, by the property owner and the city of Raleigh prior to the first certificate of occupancy um, for, for the new building. The request would increase entitlement across residential, office, and retail uses or combinations thereof. But I want to reiterate that the proposed conditions limit building height to 15 stories or 165 feet. And there is a trip budget as well. The request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and the future land use map. And although the request is inconsistent with the urban form map, since it does not include a typical frontage, the tier three site planning condition would require a hybrid frontage be included upon development. The request is consistent with several policies related to compact development and development near transit. And also some area specific policies for the Dix Edge area study and the, um, the Southern Gateway study, uh, Southern Railway area plan. Um, inconsistent policies are largely related to the urban pattern, density transitions, and urban frontage. Um, but again, as I mentioned, hyperfrontage would be required for a tier three site plan. I'll also note that the applicant has included many prohibited uses, which include many higher impact ones, such as uh, commercial car wash, vehicle fuel sales, drive-throughs, medical and medical facilities, uh, facilities. But some higher intensity commercial uses, such as late night bars and retail, would still be permitted upon approval. The Planning Commission recommended approval of the request seven to two, saying that approval would allow for more housing, uh, including apartments and townhomes, and a greater, greater unit density for residential, retail, office uses, or a combination thereof. And it's also within walking distance of public transit and transit lines specifically that are planned for increased service frequency. Um, I will note that the applicant submitted unsigned conditions after February 29th that would reduce the base district to a 12-story height limit and remove condition number three, which currently restricts height. So I figured that was worth mentioning in case the applicant wants to talk about it. Um, and can I ask, answer any questions before you open the public hearing? Council Member Fort. Uh, can you remind me what the two dissident votes from the Planning Commission were based on? Yeah, so Commissioner Bennett was concerned that the proposed height increase would contrast with the Fuller Heights neighborhood, which um, was part of the reason, as, my, as I understand it, that the applicant added some conditions limiting height. And Commissioner Peeler said he wished to see more affordable housing than was being proposed. Okay, any other questions? Okay, um, I'm going to open up the... Um, Let's see. We do not have anyone who's we do not have anybody who signed up in opposition. And let's see, Sam is here to um, speak. So we'll line up eight minutes. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of City Council, Samuel Morris with Longleaf Law Partners, 4509 Creedmoor Road, Suite 302, here on behalf of the applicant and property owner. And thank you, Matthew, for that good recap of the case. At this time, the applicant's going to request that we keep the hearing open in order to make some further updates to our conditions, in addition to reducing the height to 12 stories. We've had some conversations about um, clarifying the green stormwater infrastructure condition as well as enhancing the affordable housing condition. Um, so we're still working on getting those updates made. Um, so if it works for you all, we'll keep the hearing open and then uh, come back on a date certain with those updated conditions to make the full presentation of our case. And from a timing perspective, we're okay with, with May. The first meeting of May would probably be ideal for us, but open to hear what works for you all. 
Yeah, I think we have some availability on May 7th. Um, and Council Member Patton, I'm just going to do a check if <laughs> that sounds reasonable, but yeah. Yeah, I think if we um, hold this open to May 7th, that would put us at um, nine public hearings. Um, usually Bynum kind of recalibrates us during report of planning commissions so as staff can check my notes. I've got in the afternoon, Zero Gorman Street, and then in the evening, Mordecai Conservation Overlay District, Strickland Road, Blue Ridge MSD, and a bunch of annexations. Um, and then North Boylan Assemblage, is that, that just, is that close? Which would be eight, eight in place currently, this would make nine. Yeah, since no one has signed up in opposition as well, um, shouldn't be. Do it in the afternoon. Yeah. Afternoon. Yeah, let's set it for May 7th afternoon. That's my motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, that was unanimous. Thank you. See you back on the 7th. Okay, the next item is um, rezoning Z3923. Hi, good afternoon, Sarah Shaughnessy, Raleigh Planning and Development. So this is the rezoning request um, to rezone two parcels, 902 and 916 Nile Road from R4 to RX4, with parking limited frontage and zoning conditions. You last discussed this case at your March 19th meeting. Um, since then, the applicant has submitted revised conditions. So I'm here to share information about those conditions um, and some additional information with you. Um, if you'll recall, the site is located northeast of the intersection of 54 and I-40. Um, staff were contacted by the Department of Agriculture um, late yesterday afternoon who manage, own and manage the site um, just directly adjacent northeast of the site. And there is um, a closed landfill that's north of the site and downhill from the site that's being uh, monitored um, by NCDEQ. So any development on that site would require coordination with that state agency and the applicant is aware of that, but just wanted to share that additional piece of information with you all since it wasn't in the staff report. Um, some additional views of the site. Again, um, the site is just north of the Null Point uh, subdivision development. And changes to conditions. Um, there are three main changes. Um, one is to increase the front setback, so the building setback um, from 100 feet to 115, street, uh, 115 feet. The um, other change to the condition um, is to increase um, the setback from 15 feet to 20 feet. So sorry, that, that first change um, was the setback from the parcels to the rear. So the rear setback increasing from 100 feet to 115 feet. And then the front setback from the primary street from 15 to 20 feet. Um, and then the third change here is the addition of a new condition requiring a parking setback. Um, of 30 feet from those same rear parcels. Um, I know the applicant has signed up to speak um, in favor. I'm happy to answer any questions before you hear from them. Okay, um, let's see, we have somebody who has also signed up in opposition. This is a resumption of the um, public, I mean the public hearing, so we'll, let's do four minutes per side. I have a quick question for staff before we start. Um, yeah, Council Member Patton. Um, so with respect to the new information you gave us about the closed landfill monitoring, what um, type of monitoring would be happening to this parcel? I am going to defer to our stormwater staff to speak to that. Hi, Wayne Miles, stormwater manager with Engineering Services. At this time, there are no conditions related to any monitoring or stormwater provisions that are proposed as part of the rezoning, so there would no, be no mandatory or regulatory monitoring that would be required on this property. It would only be a part of the downtown state property. I'm sorry, downstream state property. Oh, okay. 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 okay, thank you. We'll resume the hearing. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and members of the council. Isabel Maddox, Nichols and Crampton, uh, 3700 Glenwood, Raleigh 27612. Um, a couple things. One, um, Sarah went over the new conditions. We increased our rear setback. We increased our front setback. We added a parking setback. All uh, things that you know the neighborhood 
representatives, Bob Geary and Bruce Hamill, had seemed to one, and we really left this meeting, at, we had a meeting immediately after the meeting, we thought, okay, we're in pretty good shape. We then had a subsequent meeting, and they're, they're still having some issues. Um, I have been in contact with Council Member Harrison, and, and uh, we agreed as of yesterday that perhaps we should take another two-week deferral and see if we could add some further conditions to address the neighborhood concerns. They're very focused on having a three-story versus a four-story building, and we have, I think we can agree to go to a 50-foot height max, which is the same as a three-story max, but still allow us to do four stories within that 50 feet. And hopefully that will get them to a point where they can be agreeable to this case. Um, we worked very hard to try to get there. Um, some other things they raised with Council Member Harrison really re related to basically having a fully engineered site plan which we don't have, and, you know, and nobody has that at zoning, or almost nobody has it. It's you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to get that prepared. We don't have stormwater calculations done. We have, don't have a grading plan, et cetera. But we, we've, we feel like we've given some pretty good conditions restricting this building and where it's going to be located. Um, as to the comment, we heard about that, this, the closed landfill issue yesterday. I've passed that along to my team um, we certainly will look at that. Um, I'm not aware of, of additional heightened requirements on an adjoining property owner, um, but we'll certainly take that into to account as as we design this project. And I'll reserve any any uh, time for rebuttal. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, have um, Bruce Mammel. Hello, Mayor and Council. I'm Bruce Mamel, 904 Cedar Downs Drive, 27607. And I'll keep coming down here as long as I need to to get the applicant to provide us with a pretty clear idea of what's going to happen on this property. Um, let's think about the big picture for a second here. Um, in terms of planning, you've got the PNC Arena a mile away which is going to be a gambling parlor, and it's going to be across the street from a Catholic high school. So let's start with that. At a micro view, if I'm standing on the beginning of Null Road looking to the north, on the left I see development the way it's traditionally happened with lots of setbacks, plantings, all those things. The proposal here is going to set a precedent on the east side of the road with frontage right at the street, four stories, It'll set the precedent going north if those smaller businesses decide to uh, sell, okay? With regard to the specific conditions here, uh, we've mentioned numerous times. I sent you guys an email. You've received other emails from some other people in the neighborhood. Um, uh, we wanted a buffer in back. They say 30-foot buffer now. We don't know where the stormwater is going to be. Can you tell me that? Where is the stormwater retention? Is it going to be in a parking lot up to that 30-foot point? Is it going to be in the buffer? Is it going to be an open pond? I don't have that answer. I'd really like to know what that is before I consent to whatever it is they're asking for. Um, we talked about lighting, no conditions for that. We talked about um, a fence or a wall of some kind. They mentioned a fence, but we'd really like an opaque wall so that the street lights, not the street lights, but the car lights as they're coming in, because they're going to come in at this grade and come down this grade, depending on how it gets graded, and those lights are going to be sweeping my neighbor's backyards all the time. So I want you to think about what it would be like in your backyard. Um, I also pointed out that there's a zoning case at the corner of Nolan 54, that if you look very closely at that, that's the result of what some of the recent planning has been. And I'll reserve my time. We had 155. To reiterate, um, this property is on an urban thoroughfare and in a city growth area. There's a lot of growth in this area. We've done a study of all the buildings around it, and there are a lot of four- and five-story, even seven-story buildings on this corridor. We're asking for a 50-feet height limit, which is the same as a three-story building. Um, we have agreed to increase the building setback, but we, we think the type of urban development the city has wanted over the last, I don't know, five, ten 15 years, is pull the buildings up to the street, put the parking in the rear, and that's what we're trying to do. As to where the stormwater facility is going, you know, normally it's a low point in the site, but it can't go in the buffer. That's a UDO requirement, the prohibition. But it, it could go between the parking 
in the neighborhood. I'm not sure where it'll go until we have the site, the grading done, and the engineering done. Um, but And as to the uh, vehicle light shining in people's uh, window, those vehicles will be at least 30 feet away from those residential property lines, so you're probably at least another 30, 50 feet away from home. So I don't think those lights are going to be that problematic. Also, as to lights like parking lot lights and taller lights, that there's a really restrictive city ordinance about lighting fixtures and how they have to be, um, you know, oriented downward, have shields so they don't go into the neighboring properties. Uh, so there's some pretty good restrictions on a lighting ordinance by the city. Uh, as to fences and walls, um, there's, again, a UDO requirement that you, if you do a fence, you do a 20-foot buffer. If you do a wall, you do a 10-foot buffer. Uh, and the, that's specced out pretty well in the, in the code. Um, so I feel like we've really addressed some, some concerns that have been expressed to us, short of having a fully blown site plan. Um, and I, I think these, these separations we're offering to the neighborhood are going to provide them a lot of protection. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not buying it. <laughs> um, I've seen a lot of zoning cases. I've been doing this for 25 years. I've seen a lot of details. I've seen a lot of conditions. The conditions are where the meat and potatoes are. And I think that they can come up with better details. I can't support four stories. Thank you. OK. Um, at the start, did you ask that this be held? Yes, we'd like to hold the public hearing open, if possible. And then continue to another date. Two questions. Okay, Councilmember Patton was first, then Branch. Cool. Um, question for staff. Um, can you confirm there would be neighborhood transition required? Because this is RX, and then that's correct. That's yes, right. and okay. The so then they residential have, districts. So yes. then they have those three options: they have the trees, or the trees in the fence, or the trees in the wall. Correct. But, just the wall? Um, I'd have to take a look at those options, but there are three it's different three. options um, okay. that Isabel outlined that awesome. are correct. Yeah. So, so they went, Isabel, we have seen other conditions where applicants will specify which of those options they'll employ, and I, I wonder if that might be useful here to provide the level of certainty that the residents are, are <coughs> seeking. I would be pretty comfortable agreeing that we'll go to either a 20-foot buffer as opposed to the 10, 20-foot buffer plus fence, or if there's Good trees back there. I think that's a far better buffer. That's existing trees, tree conservation areas, and I personally feel like that's the best buffer for neighborhoods. So I would say we would agree to a condition that says either the 20-foot plus a fence or tree conservation areas um, along that back. Because I really do think the tree buffer is, is the gold standard for a buffer. You know, mature trees that meet the... Um, criteria for a tree conservation area. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably the best buffer. But um, your this parcel is um, less than two acres, so you won't have TCA. Is that right? We only have a TCA requirement, but we we're allowed to substitute a TCA in lieu of the buffer. So we could do a if we if we meet the density requirements for the trees, we're allowed to do that area um, for. Um, in, in lieu of the buffer. Transition. So, it, I mean, you get a buffer, it's just not a planted buffer because you've already got trees there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, okay. I, I don't have a problem taking away the option of, ten, of a 10 foot. I have no problem with that. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm just, I'm trying to, you know, I, what I'm hearing from the residents is a desire for more certainty. So, where there's opportunities to provide that through the conditions, even, it, even though the UDO does have lots of things, where it's where there's opportunity to provide that higher degree of certainty yeah. through the conditions well, that is useful. I, I don't have a, an objection to it except for do we want to cut down a lot of good mature trees back there just to put a buffer where we plant some, some new trees that are not don't give nearly the protection? I just think that's a bad, you know, bad development to do it that way. So I'm not trying to be objectionable, but do you understand my point that it's it's a a healthy, you know, existing tree buffer to me is really the best kind of buffer. 
But I mean, I can talk with my team about it, but I, I would be hesitant to just go clear cut a bunch of trees to go back in and plant, you know, one shade tree every hundred feet or whatever it is, um, whatever the, you know, rhythm of the trees is, is required to be. I just don't, that doesn't make any sense to me. It seems like you're better off to keep the existing. Knowing your architect on this, He's probably the biggest keeping the tree advocate in the city of Raleigh. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> so we have, a, I know we have one of the city's say. best architects, Ted Van Dyke, working on this, and he'll be all about that. Yeah, I guess what I'm just trying to say, I mean, it's, it's not for me to die on the hill of keeping the trees or not, but what I, if we rise above the individual requests, what the residents are saying to us is they desire for more certainty. So wherever it can be provided, where you can provide massing drawings or an exhibit that shows where the trees will be kept, I think those would be fruitful to your conversations with the neighbors. So that's um, well, you know, we, we we have provided a conceptual site plan. We can we can provide that again, um, and we I don't know that we we have a tree survey yet. Again, those things come a little bit later in the process. Typically, mm -hmm. um, we can certainly discuss that. And I mean, I'm not trying to argue with you, Council Member Patton. Um, and I understand your point about trying to provide more certainty. Um, it's just some of the requests seem to and expect uh, some decisions having been made at this point that it's a little early in the, in the process to make. Um, I think we could, if we say an either or, like either the 20 foot or the TCA buffer, we could also add some conditions requiring some fast growing evergreens that give you a little bit more substantial opaque buffer. So you're either gonna have a you know, 20, 20 feet of trees, which you're not going to really be able to see through very well, or we'll put evergreens that stay green the whole year and keep give you a, a more opaque sort of situation back there. I think we could do that. Um, okay. Council Member Branch, and then Mayor Pro Tem. So I have a qu one question for each of you. My question for you is, with all of th this conversation, <laughs> is three days long enough? because you have to have conditions in by Friday in order to be back by the 16th. Um, I, that's what my client has been, been you know, planning for, is to try to get these conditions um, you know, done. One of them will be limiting the height to 50 feet, and we could do the, the landscape that we've just discussed. Um, I think we can do it by Friday. OK. Um, if for some reason, I would say this, if for some reason we realize that it's not going to be enough. Um, You'll let us know on the 16th. Yeah, we'll, 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 you know, we'll communicate with staff. Obviously, they'll know if they don't get the conditions, and we'll, you know, I can show back up to ask you to bump it again. Okay, thank you. And my question for you, sir, is you mentioned the height, and you mentioned, well, you mentioned three stories. You are, your desire to see three stories. And from what I'm hearing from the applicant, is that they're willing to do the three-story height, but just have four stories. So my question then is, is it a height issue or is it a stories issue? Both. So density, right? They initially came in, they said, we want 40 to 45 units with whatever the parking would be in the back. So we said, okay, whatever that however that works out property-wise, boundary-wise, et cetera. And then staff said, well, you can have 57 units. But then we didn't know what the impervious surface was going to be or what the parking was going to be. The lot line where the parking lot was going to be started off at 100 feet. Now it's at 30 feet. The building, the first condition said the building could be at 100 feet. But when you looked at the initial drawing, that 100 feet was an 80-foot stormwater area than a 20-foot buffer. So we're going back and forth like a yo-yo. We're not really sure. That's why I say I'll keep pushing here because we're not really sure exactly how this is going to work. So, so from what I'm hearing on something you just said, when you said both, you mentioned the number of units. I guess your real desire is to reduce the number of units. What we want is for you guys to be able to say, you know what, this is a great project. It's really easy. It can go, it can just go right in there, slick as a whistle, as opposed to how do we shoehorn in every last little thing? I get that, but neighborhood character, quality of life, scale, all those things matter to us. 
you know? And I, and I, I said, you know, there's 3D programs. How, how difficult is it to sit down and put a box on a 3D program and say, okay, here's the shadows, here's the height, here's what it's going to look like? You know, it doesn't take that long in today's okay. world. I got to think. So, you know, and right now, Isabel's saying, well, yeah, we can talk about these various conditions that are in the UDO or whatever. And where have we had that conversation? You know, I mean, where if we, okay, fine, we're going to talk in the next three days here, but then, you know, it's, we got to keep asking in order to get to that point, right? We got to keep saying, well, what about this? What about this? What about that? And then like drip, drip, drip. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. I mean, you, you provided some information. Um, that's helpful. Thank you. Okay. Hey, um, Mayor Pro Tem, you done? Okay. Council Member Harrison. Um, okay. I just want to uh, summarize a few things, uh, make sure I'm, I've got it all. What I see in the proposed zoning entitlement is a maximum number of 57 units. Can I just get staff to confirm that? That's what's here. That's correct, yeah. So when um, staff evaluates a rezoning request, we look at the maximum total units that could be developed based on the proposed zoning, and we compare that to the existing zoning. And it's typically an overestimate. It's typically thinking about if the site was developed to its full, full potential, um, what it could be developed. And we use that to evaluate infrastructure sufficiency. So we really want to look at like the maximum number that could possibly fit on the site. As, as a way to be conservative about those infrastructure impacts. So yeah, 57 is the absolute maximum number. I think as the applicant has stated, it would likely be less than that. Okay, so I, I just wanted to make sure that, um, I, sorry, I can't see uh, Mr. Mammel, um, that that is the max number of units. So it cannot be above 57. Um, I do want to note that there has been a very robust conversation that has been happening. Um, I, I think that's probably obvious um, between neighbors and applicants and myself. And I do think there's been a lot of improvement on this case for everyone. So I do want to commend um, Isabel and her team for, you know, adding those buffers on the front, the rear, rear setback, the front setback. Um, they have increased that since the last time that we saw this case two weeks ago. Um, and then they've also offered to bring the height down to 50 feet, which is the same as what three stories would be. So I think that's pretty commendable. Um, and the unit count does not, again, cannot go past 57 units. Um, I think the other couple of comments that I've heard that perhaps could just need some more detail um, or could be addressed are related to this conversation Councilmember Patton was having about um, the, the buffer. So what does it look like? Is it using the tree conservation area? Is it fast growing evergreens? Um, can we get some clarity on that to provide to neighbors so that they know what to expect? And if there are options, can we ask the neighbors, what would you prefer? Do you prefer the trees that exist that are there? That would be my preference. But if something else is preferred, then perhaps that's a conversation that needs to happen. Um, in terms of stormwater, it sounds like it'll be a pond. Um, typically, you know, underwater, or sorry, <laughs> underground, you know, stormwater devices, those are more expensive. Um, and so I wouldn't expect that unless there's a condition in there. So it probably will be a pond. Um, I know there was some conversation about the car lights. Um, and I don't know if there's anyone here from, I don't know if it'd be from planning, who could talk about rules or regulations around lights and parking lots or anything that we do in that regard. I'm just not sure. Um, we could certainly bring that information back to you. I don't, or Isabel could share some information. Well, I don't think there's a, a, UDA, a UDA requirement that deals with automobile lights. I think there's one that deals with like parking lot lights, building lights, so that they're not allowed to be sh shown on the adjoining properties. They're to be directed away. Vehicle lights are not a part of that. Um, but, I, but what I was saying is that the distance with a 30-foot parking setback, and you've got a buffer that's either going to be evergreens or existing trees and 30 feet, I don't think you're going to get that headlights in my dining room window. Mm -hmm. Um, can can any conversation from staff on parking lot lights be offered? Is do we have a UDO rule on that? <laughs> I 
Uh, good afternoon, Pat Young with Planning and Development. There's not only um, for structure parking. So we do have requirements to mitigate or baffle those lights for um, parking garages, structure parking, but not for on-site. As the applicant suggested, it is normally managed by a combination of uh, buffering, fences, and distance. Okay. Are there any, um, I don't know, best practices out there about where the lights are shining, like angles or um, wattage? <laughs> Sorry, Pat, if this is not your expertise, but. <laughs> well, it's not my expertise. It's something we certainly looked at before. Um, again, the, the, there is um, required landscaping around parking lots. So again, the, the intention was that that required landscaping around parking lots would significantly mitigate or soften those impacts and not have the direct um, shining of, of the headlights into people's adjacent property. Um, there, I'm not aware of practices for smaller scale development, right? Non-structure parking, something, mm -hmm. some, certainly something we can look at or investigate, but I'm not aware of either any conditions or any practices that are, exceed our own. Okay, but there is some, you said greenery or, that has to be around the, the parking lot itself. That's right. Okay, and can you tell me what that is, what the rules are? Um, I'd have to confirm. Uh, <laughs> I don't fine. have that committed to, to memory, but it's a combination of, sh it's mostly shrubs. Mm -hmm. If it's a large enough parking lot, there could be trees. Um, I'd have to confirm that. But, but you're also going to have a buffer in the rear. You're going to have a buffer of 20 mm -hmm. feet, and then you're going to have 30 feet. Speaking of the mic, Isabel. Speaking of the mic. You're going to have a buffer of, of 20 feet, and then you're going to have, your parking's not going to begin until 30 feet from the line. So. Your combination of distance and that pretty heavy buffer, I think, should give you some protection. Mm -hmm. the, only, the only code ordinance I know about lights might be in a car wash context. Um, but for the most part, that's not a, a thing that is usually regulated. I think, and as far as I know. Pat, could you confirm that 20-foot buffer? So there's 20-foot buffer required with yes. this on the rear side? Yes. Okay. And that has to be... Um, some kind of live Yeah, it's, uh, it's vegetated to a certain opacity, right? So oh, that okay. they're, they're, it, it can't be sparse material. It has to be at a certain fullness um, during, during season. Okay, and as Isabel noted, we can, sh they can use the tree conservation area mm -hmm. to create that. Yes. Okay, all right, thank you. Yeah, thanks, sure. Um, I did see one more just hand from Mr. Mammel in case there's anything else that you wanted to bring up um, that I didn't summarize. So we have a 20-foot buffer and then another 10 feet to the parking lot. Is 30 that feet. So 20-foot buffer and I, then 30 feet. So it's, there's, did or, I get that right? It's a 30-foot building set, I mean, parking setback, so it's 30 feet from the line. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so then it's, you're right, 20, 20 feet. 20 foot buffer and then 10 feet for the water retention pond. Not necessarily. The stormwater pond could be on the side. It might not be in the okay. rear. All right, because the way the, slant, the, the the way that the land slopes is from the southwest to the northeast corner. Mm -hmm. So presumably down in that corner somewhere, I'm guessing. Yeah. Then there's a manhole right at the corner of two of the lots at the back there, and there will be an easement mm -hmm. that will have to get cut in there somehow, mm -hmm. just so we're clear. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, so I, I think we're pretty close. Um, I know there's still discussion to be had. Um, it sounds like Isabel thinks she can get it done by this Friday. I know we have a lot of cases coming up, so I'm not sure what to do with the date there. I'm going to go Council Member Patton. Yep. Looks like we have on April 16th um, already nine public hearings. Um, for on a variety of topics, um, and May 7th also has nine, so those are both over the eight. That's sort of our a, a soft agreement with one another, so May 21st would be my recommendation. Well, can you, you tell, can you say what type of public hearings we have? Yeah, Usually, I'm, like if there's annexations, those go pretty quick. So on April 16th, we have downtown MSD expansion and then all the ones that we just approved through the consent agenda for the issuance of the bond anticipation notes. Then we have five rezonings and two annexations. Um, so that's April 16th. Um, May 7th, we have the Blue Ridge MSD, Mordecai uh, text change, and then 
four rezonings and three annexations, if my, note, if my notes are still accurate. But this one will not be a full blown because we've already done that. We hopefully it can be just here are our new conditions kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You've gotten the most time today, so hard to know. <laughs> <laughs> hard to know. Touche. <laughs> Well, hopefully by next time, most of these questions will be addressed. So, what are we thinking? I feel like May is a little bit safer, giving timing um, of getting this done, um, just because I know some folks are gonna be out of town. I don't know how we will connect that easily this week. I'm gonna be gone starting tomorrow through the end of the week. Um, so that would be my recommendation, is to go for May 7th, um, if we can. How in the afternoon? That? I think that's what it is. We're at nine. During the day. During the day. You're saying that's when we have more, Megan? We have Sorry. nine, then we have two in the afternoon and, and many in the evening. So do three. Yeah. So that's when make three in the afternoon. It yeah. seems that May 7th during the day would be the best option. Okay, that'll be my motion to hold this to May 7th so afternoon. All right, I'm going to ask, though, I see the face. Is is that going to cause issues? From my, my client won't like it, but he'll have to get over it. <laughs> okay, May 7th. We'll be fine with that. Sorry to be flippant. <laughs> okay, um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, that was unanimous. Thank you. All right. April 16th and May 7th are full, colleagues. No more cases on those days, please. Um, next, we have um, report and recommendation of EDI committee. Thanks. The committee recommends that staff return with a special item for further discussion by the full council regarding the following. Recommendations for allocating remaining capital reserve funds to support quickly deployable investments in downtown that support cleanliness, safety, public art, and wayfinding. Two, certain policy recommendations impacting downtown that have no direct cost of implementation. Three, reallocation of previously appropriated funds, both American Rescue Plan Act and CIP funds to support the Fayetteville Street Streetscape study. And then the last one would be an examination of other areas to which the remaining capital reserve funding may be allocated. Um, just to give some context, there was a discussion in committee about if we allocate these remaining funds to sort of the safety and cleanliness issues downtown, what other citywide priorities um, would not be receiving those funds and where could the funds make the most impact now? And so having more of a holistic discussion we thought would be helpful and for the full council. So we don't have a recommendation on this funding. Our recommendation is that staff bring this back as a special item. So that's the, the motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, and Again, this item will remain in committee, and so will the economic development um, HBCU roundtable discussion. I'm sorry. Um, what did I didn't catch what you said? I said um, that was the only thing I had for today. That this item uh, will remain in committee. The item is the whole item is the um, that report we got on the Fayetteville Street in downtown, and I understand two more parts will be coming too. So that will remain in committee, and then the HBCU roundtable discussion also remains in committee. Okay. Councilmember Black, you wanted to add something? Yeah, so as a part of that conversation, what was lifted up was that we, you know, we hadn't necessarily circled back to some of the council priorities with the funds that we had. So I guess now that it's been like a week, I wanted to ask staff when that's going to be coming back for a conversation. Do you have a, a date for that? Uh, so just to be clear that the motion was for that to come with these items. So the fourth thing was an examination of other areas to which the remaining funds could be allocated. So the discussion would be um, the downtown priorities we discussed to committee and then the other priorities that council could consider. So that's what we just voted on? To yeah, like, all okay. of it's going to come back together as a special item. I don't know when they're planning to bring it to us. Though. Oh, okay. Yes, so... Give us a little bit. Um, I don't want to overcommit, but we'll bring it in the next month. So just a quick question so I can understand. Um, we're sending just part of, this is just part of that item? 
Because you're saying the item remains in committee. Yeah. So they, if you remember that report we got from DRA and the consultants was right. massive. We, our first committee meeting on this, they gave us like an overview again. And we said, this is way too much stuff for us to talk about. Could you please bring us, so the first part was please bring us quickly deployable investments we could make for safety, cleanliness, wayfinding, and how we would pay for it. So we had that discussion at the last committee meeting. Okay. We also had a discussion about what are some freebies or policy changes we can make that have no funding associated with them. And so we had that discussion, but there was also a discussion at the committee that we thought the full council should be involved in how we allocate this money and concerns about maybe other areas of concern citywide that uh, capital reserve money, if we allocate all of the remaining to downtown, um, is that the best way to do it? And so having a sort of a give and take priority exchange, and there was a conversation about um, when we all did our survey as council members about how we wanted to allocate capital reserves, did everybody's priorities get designated? And so we're, what we're planning to do when it comes back as a special item is have a holistic discussion about Here's what money we have available. Here's how it could be used for downtown for the quickly deployable safety and cleanliness issues. Here are other ways it could be used or not used. One discussion that came up a lot in committee was like bus shelter, stuff like that. And then we can decide as a full council, do we want to, um, what do we want to fund for downtown? What do we not want to fund? And um, what else we may want to fund? Regarding the full report from DRA, there's still two more or three more parts that are coming to us. And even just the Fayetteville Street part, there's a lot of stuff in there that's gonna take a long time to work through and fund. But we were like, what money do we have now and how can we deploy it quickly for the maximum impact? So that's what we'll have as a special item discussion. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Growth and natural resources. Yeah, so we met on March 26 and discussed the rezoning of Hardin Road, case Z2823, specifically um, related to stormwater concerns. Um, and so there were um, a couple themes to support the case as is, and then there were concerns um, uh, raised as well. So the supportive themes were that zoning conditions as is meet the highest stormwater control standard um, in terms of number of years, a hundred year event um, in the city, and that also development of the site, um, of any site, is typically um, not expected to address pre-existing issues that are not related to the development of the site. Um, concerns raised were that properties in the area are experiencing erosion and surface water impacts, including stream erosion. The development site sits at a significantly higher grade than adjacent properties, um, which means there could be additional offsite impacts. Um, there is limited public stormwater infrastructure in the area, and private stormwater infrastructure may be insufficient or in poor condition. The neighborhood downstream and House Creek already experienced negative stormwater impacts from the I-440 Beltline expansion project, and there were also concerns raised about insufficient detail um, of the stormwater devices for the rezoning proposal. Um, we did ask for a couple of additional um, uh, clarifications, um, both from staff and the applicant. Staff was asked to conduct additional research about documented stormwater complaints and concerns to address um, what the neighborhood brought up. The applicant was also asked to identify any opportunities for green stormwater infrastructure to complement um, what is planned for on-site detention. And then also, given that a site plan has not been prepared, um, there was a recommendation to the applicant that graphical depictions would be beneficial to deliberations. Um, so this is really relevant to tonight when we'll have the public hearing again for Hardin Road. Um, for GNR committee, we moved that item out, so we will not see it again. Our next item will be held or heard on April 23rd. And I'm sorry, is that right? Yeah, April 23rd, I think. Yeah, okay, but I'm just checking. What is our topic? Strickland Road, okay, there we go, thank you. <laughs> yeah, um, so anyway, our next uh, topic will be Strickland Road rezoning um, related to, I 
water concerns being in the Falls Lake uh, drinking water supply shed. Okay. Thank you. Um, safe, vibrant, and healthy community committee. We don't have any items. And um, transportation and transit. No report, no items. Okay. Next, we have a report from the mayor and city council. Um, we'll start with Mayor Pro Tem. I just want to say go pack, and other than that, I have no report. Um, I just wanted to highlight some good stuff from the consent agenda. Um, lots of speed limit reductions in my district, Carlton Park and Holden Ridge subdivisions. Um, also wanted to let the public know that through the consent agenda, we set the public hearings for some items. Uh, these are related to bond anticipation notes, and these public hearings will occur on uh, April 16th. So this is convert, you know, Allison, if I get this wrong, please let me know, but is converting one type of short-term debt to a longer term type of debt. Um, so this would be related to debt related to the East Civic Tower, fire stations one and three, and the convention center. So I just wanted the public to know about that. And other than that, I have no report. Council Member Black. I lost my train of thought for a second. Hi, I just want to say happy Earth Month. So if, if you haven't gotten outside to touch some grass, I suggest you do. If you're one of the universe's favorite, like me, who doesn't have pollen allergies, then good for you. Uh, no offense. But um, other than that, just happy Earth Month and no report. No report. I'm clearly not one of the universe's favorites because I'm struggling really heavily with pollen allergies right now. <laughs> um, but I just have three quick things. Uh, congratulations again to our vehicle fleet services team for winning Geotap 2024 Excellence Award for the public sector on February 14th. Really proud of you guys. Uh, also, thank you to RPD for scheduling a community meeting with Meredith Woods to discuss safety concerns in their neighborhood. We had a great turnout and it was a good reminder that RPD needs community support to prevent crime. Uh, doo -doo -doo. We have to take preventative measures like locking our car doors and homes so that we don't fall victims to crimes of opportunity. And then lastly, my next community meeting will be held on April 10th from 6 to 8 p.m. at New World Cafe off of Durley Road. Come out and have a chat about what's going on in the city. Thank you. I have just a couple of items. Uh, first, go pack. I was so excited to watch the game on Sunday, both games. The women were amazing. And the men were pretty good too. So it was, uh, it was a good day. Um, <laughs> so I do have a couple of serious items. Uh, the first is Forest Park. And it packed. No, that was very serious. Pack basketball is <laughs> very serious. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Um, I did get a request from Forest Park neighbors. Um, I'm sorry, Cameron Park neighbors who have been working to change um, the name of their neighborhood over the last few years. They've been successful on many government and commercial maps, um, but they still have one last uh, name change to go through, which is related to their NCOD. So right now it's still... Um, titled Cameron Park NCOD, and they want to change it to Forest Park NCOD. And I'd like to request council approval to initiate that text change as it has been requested by neighbors. Um, so that's my, I guess, motion is to initiate a text change to change the name Cameron Park NCOD to Forest Park NCOD. Second. All in favor? That was unanimous, thank you. And one more item. Um, I did have the honor to speak at a Trans Day of Visibility over the weekend, an event. It was a really beautiful gathering. We had a potluck brunch, songs and stories. We shared joy and heartbreak, as well as calls to action. The way we show up, how we, who we love, and how we create family should be up to us. And yet, in the past year, we've seen rights taken away from trans and non-binary individuals in our state, as well as women across this country. Individual rights, public education, and democracy are at risk in November's election this year. And I just ask Raleigh residents, please pay attention. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, I have one item. Um, this is a notification of our special meeting. Um, the Raleigh City Council will meet at 3 p.m. on April 9th um, at, we'll meet here um, at West Target Street. We are gonna tour parcels that are subject to the rezoning case Z9222 along the New Bern Avenue corridor. Um, city Council and staff will travel by bus and staff will present background material background material at three predetermined stops. Council Chambers is one, the former DMV building at 110 New Bern Avenue is the other, and the future East Park and Ride lot at 1, um, 1451 North New Hope Road. So is there anything else that I have to do related to that? Okay, thank you. All right, next we have um, appointments. Good afternoon. First, we have Police Advisory Board, Police Chief Appointee. This, the purpose of this agenda item is to simply inform you that Chief Patterson has appointed Derek Hicks to serve as her appointee on the board. His two-year term commences today. This was for information only, no council action needed. Appearance Commission, one alternate vacancy. Council Member Jones has nominated Catherine McPherson, so that will appear in your next ballot for consideration. Arts Commission, three regular vacancies. David Moore received seven votes, so would be appointed. Several nominations were made, uh, which will appear in your next ballot for the remaining two vacancies. Vanita Shaw by Councilmember Jones. Councilmember Jones and Harrison both nominated Kimberly Tyson and Eliza Kaiser. Councilmember Black nominated Xavier Skinner and Joseph Devine Campbell Jr. So that is, those five names will appear on the next ballot. Hispanic and Immigrant Affairs Board, one regular vacancy professional category. Carlos Liriano received six votes. Um, however, Councilmember Jones did make a nomination for Tammy Loza, so it's up to the council as to how to proceed with that. Let's just roll it over to the next ballot. Sure. If they received six votes, mine, it was from, so if, if since the six votes, I have no objection to You're just fine. moving. Okay. No, I'm fine. Okay, we'll, we'll proceed with it reappointing then. So Mr. Liriano is reappointed. Okay. Substance Use Advisory Commission, two regular vacancies. Joanne Agai received seven votes and Martin Woodard received six. Councilmember Black informed me she's withdrawing her nomination for Mary Elizabeth Peebles. So that fills your two vacancies there. Next on to nominations, Environmental Advisory Board, two regular vacancies. The terms of Benjamin Bobe and Jess Anastes are expiring. Mr. Bobe is not eligible due to length of service, but will continue to serve until replaced, and uh, Ms. Anastes would like to be considered. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, that was unanimous, thank you. Hispanic and Immigrant Affairs Board, one regular vacancy, community member category. The term of Ann Sophia Makua Kiyoko is expiring and she wishes to be considered for reappointment. Per council's direction regarding attendance, she did provide a statement of explanation which is included in the agenda packet. Uh, move to reappoint. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, that was unanimous, thank you. Lastly, we have Planning Commission, one regular vacancy. The term of Dwight Otwell is expiring. He would like to be considered for reappointment. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, that was unanimous as well. That's it. Okay, next we have the report and recommendation of the city attorney. No report. Okay, um, report and recommendation of the city clerk. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council, Lou Bonapane, city clerk. Uh, two items today, the first is the uh, disposition of the surplus or the city's interest in surplus property at 504 Tilden Street. The upset bid process council, council authorized in January that has concluded and it would be time to authorize uh, the city to convey the property or the, its interest in the property. Okay. Can I just ask one question? The, um, the bid is 650, and then I know we're getting like 50%. Is the 650,000, that is the 50% or is it 300 and, will we, the city receive 325? That is the bid for the property. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the bid for the property is 650. So the amount we'll receive That's is correct. the 325, okay. 
Do we have a motion? Move for approval. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, that was unanimous. Thank you. And last item, you have some minutes that have been presented for consideration of approval. Move for approval. Second. All in, <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, that was unanimous. Thank you. Um, next, we have um, closed session. Um, I will read the motion. The motion is in order to enter closed session pursuant to GS 143-318-1183 to consult with the city attorney in order to preserve the attorney-client privilege. GS 143-318-11-A4 to discuss matters relating to location or expansion of industries or other businesses within the city, including consideration of economic development incentives that may be offered by the city in negotiations. And then GS 143-318-11-A6 to consider the qualifications, competence, performance, character, fitness, conditions of appointment or conditions of initial employment of an individual public officer or employee or prospective public officer or employee. Do I have a second? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Okay, thank you.
We have just returned from a closed session where the council provided direction to staff on the items listed in the closed session motion. Council will reconvene at 7 p.m. Thank you.